Curiosity is wonderful. So let them tell you stuff, ask questions because you're curious, and then you'll get more information rather than... You know, I found out more about the guy sitting on a plane next to me than he's told anybody in 20 years with the same kind of an exercise. If I walk into most rooms, like I had a show last night for 85 people in San Antonio, Texas, I knew every single person's name in that room, every single person's first name. How? Do we all lie, all human beings? And is it okay to lie? All people lie. The research varies. Some research says some people will lie 10 times within a conversation. 10 um, times, like in one set or it can in a be 30 minute conversation? Hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Uh, Meanwhile, I just you know, had a fight with my significant other. So uh -huh. that would be a lie. Then also lying by omission is a big thing. People think that that I have to say the lie for it to be a lie. But I can tell you a story and leave something out mm. that changes the context of the story. So now the story is not accurate. I mislead you. That is a lie. And actually the number one way people lie is by omission. Because most people don't like to lie. They're not comfortable with it. You know, it's not natural to us. It's work. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. It's very hard. Because you, you got to remember what you said too, right? You got to remember it. You have to stick to it because you may have to repeat that lie again later oh in gosh. time. And it really is a credibility killer. It's just not worth doing. And so it's a lot of work to do cognitively. So it is actually easier to leave something out. I don't feel as bad. And then when you ask me, Lewis, I say, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you that part. Uh, and then you lose credibility. If I lie like that, I may not lose as okay. much. Gotcha. It's when people outright lie. And then so you probably did some outright lies and yeah. I think Did you that do they... this, yes or no? Uh, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> or how about this, no, I didn't do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> That's like one of the indicators um, when people say um, their body doesn't match, it with, doesn't match uh, what they say, so they'll say no, yes. Yeah. And so you'll see the body will do this, like the body's in conflict with what they're saying. It doesn't happen to everybody. It's everybody, everyone is so unique and so different. And I think what popular culture likes to do um, is say, everybody will do this. Mm -hmm. Everybody will do that. And that's just, it's false. And there's no easy way to read people. It's work. It's studying the person, understanding human behavior, knowing that mm -hmm. person, pay, paying attention to their mannerisms. So like when I speak, I, I use illustrators when I speak. So if I'm telling you a story, I went here last night, I did this, I saw that. Now you ask me something, you know, Evie, is this your favorite podcast? Which it is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right? But I start, you know, I put my hands down and I, I change my mm. mannerisms. Now I'm stoic. Mm. I'm not moving. Um, in fact, people t who do lie tend to move less, actually. Because I'm working. I'm working. This is work. Oh. So I'm not, I'm thinking, I'm focused. So there's all those indicators that do help you kind of filter out what's going on. With the other person. So using body language and being more expressive hides the lie if you are lying? If you're usually, not all. Like I want to be, you right, know, because right, some right. people that don't use a lot of maneuvers, they're always stoic. Sure, sure, sure. And so that's just what they are all the time. But if you have someone who is illustrative, who's always mm -hmm. talking with their hands, and now they, you ask them a question that they're uncomfortable with or they want to lie to you about, you'll see less movement in the body. What would be three questions, if you could only ask three questions to a human being to figure out if they're telling a lie or telling the truth, how would you start those three questions? What would they be? Ted, T-E-D, tell me, explain, describe, and then I would fill in the rest. Tell me. Tell me what you did last night, rather than who did you out with last night or were you with Sam last night? So tell me what you did last night. Uh, Explain to me how important this relationship is to you. Describe to me what you want in this business partnership. Those questions allow people to tell a story. So if you really want to read someone out, read somebody, you want them to tell you a story. So the more I can get you to tell me a story, I hear you, I'm watching you, I'm getting your mannerisms mm -hmm. down, everything. But then you're also telling me what is important to you? What is of value to you? And then when you do that now, I don't have to sit there and guess and figure out, oh, how should I start my business pitch with Lewis? 
you already told me the things you like, mm. and so I can come in and speak to you in an intelligent way, rather than trying to guess what you know what to say. So ideally, when you start a conversation, and this could be for anything, it's not just catching a lie. This is really just trying to start a conversation. TED, T E D. Tell me, explain, describe. You start mm. big. You get people talking and telling you stuff, even though you're like, I want to know this specific thing. But if I ask the specific thing, this person's going to shut down on me. So I can't go straight for that. So what you do is you narrow it. You get closer. You get you go f- from vague to you know more you know accurate to more accurate to then in the end you get to that direct question because you've worked them to that point. So for example, if you had a case where somebody was murdered or killed, right, and you had a suspect, you wouldn't say, "Did, Did you, you kill her?" <laughs> You would never say that. In fact, I would, you wouldn't get there till like maybe two hours into the conversation. That's like the, you, you, you get there, it's over time uh-huh. because it's, it's, it's a serious thing. It's an ugly word. And you know, I might not even say, did you kill her? Did you hurt her? Did you harm her? Did something happen? And I would get you, so I would never ask it that way. Mm. You get the person to give you admissions. Like for example, Yes, I was there. I was at the house. Or yes, I did this. You know, you want them to give you a little bit, and then eventually you get more admissions, more admissions. Interesting. You start to paint a picture, and then you you never actually have to ask them. They tell did you. Did you kill? They eventually tell you. So you were at the scene. You were there at the same time. You were holding the knife. <laughs> they tell you all right. of it. <laughs> but you walk them, you walk them through that process. Interesting. And so when you watch these TV shows or when you ask somebody a direct question and you want a direct answer and you don't get it, this is why. It's work. It's a lot of work to connect with people, read people. And I think that's why, and I think society makes it seem like, do these three tricks and you'll have people eating out of your hand and it, it doesn't work, it's not true. And this is why people struggle because they're looking mm. for the easy way when it's really about human behavior. The person across from you, like understanding them, being curious. Curiosity is wonderful. So let them tell you stuff, ask questions because you're curious, and then you'll get more information rather than trying to go for like exactly what you want to know. And then the other thing too that helps with conversations is something called adaptability, Mm. which a lot of people don't have. Like if I have a a conversation with you and I specifically want to know one thing, Mm -hmm. but you want to tell me a whole other story around it, people don't have the patience. And so like, no, 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 no. We're talking about something else. Like stick, stick to the topic. And when you do that, you, you break a rapport, you mm. hurt the conversation. So it, a part of it is being patient. Let them take you a little bit on a journey and then slowly you can bring them back to where you want. But sometimes we come in so rigid. No, no, I have to talk about this. Mm. This is the topic. And you're not able to adapt. So adaptability is being is allowing a person to take you where they want to go. Letting somebody sit in the driver's seat oh, man. for a little bit. So you're telling me when my girlfriend is arguing with me about one thing, but then doesn't want to address it and takes it around the the uh, the playground of all these other conversations, I I get to listen to all those things to get it back to where I want to go to. Perhaps. As opposed to, babe, let's just focus on the problem right here. Well, it sounds actually like your girlfriend is actually more of an identity-based person. Mm. What so does that there's, mean? Okay, so there's instructional, there's identity. So if I'm talking to you and I want to tell you, you know, you want to tell me basically, Evie, if you stop talking to this person, your life will be easier, right? You know, cut this person out of your life, right? And I'm like, no, I want to tell you how I feel. No, mm. this makes me feel this way. This makes me feel that way. But you don't know. And you're just kind of like, all you have to do <laughs> is cut them out of your life. Cut this person out of your life. Or all you have to do is this one thing, problem solved. You are instructional. Let's just get to the point. What do we got to mm-hmm. do to fix it? One, two, three, done. Identity is, I don't want to hear that. I want to take you on the journey <laughs> with me to tell you how I feel. This person or when we are in that space, this, this means this person just wants to tell you how they're feeling. They want to tell you about their identity. What's happening is about their identity. So... They don't want, she doesn't want your solution. No, she doesn't no want you to tell you what to do. She wants you to listen to her. Mm-hmm. And so just, it's not a, even about solving it. Right. 
And so I think that's another place where we get stuck. We like, here, here's the solution. And it's like, no, no, I don't want that. And you're like, but you're telling me you have this problem. If you just do this, you're instructional, their identity. What are you? I'm typically instructional. I'm very like, just tell me what I need to know. I don't need to go through the circle. But when I speak to other per- people and I realize that their identity or in that moment, they want to tell me this whole story. And I'm just like, dude, all we got to talk about is one little thing problem solved. I let them go. Wow. If you have the patience. It depends what, <laughs> what the topic is. But she's identity based. So I think every time you talk with her, if you see that she's like not wanting to get to the point and figure out the solution where she just wants to tell you about her feelings, how this makes her feel or how this hurts her or you know, if it's about her, her identity, then that's what she's doing. It's mm-hmm. not about the solution. Whether you were in uh, the Secret Service doing an interview or an interrogation or in the real world now, I guess that is the real world, but after now, um, what are the social cues or psychological behaviors, body language, responses that people have before you take the polygraph test to know whether or not they're actually telling the truth? What are those few things that you would see we talked about the body language. Uh, are there other things that would happen, social cues or behaviors? So it's interesting. Everybody would assume that the polygraph was the, the lie detector. Like you just ask the question, come on in, have a seat, Lewis. Let's hook you up. Did right. you steal when you were a kid? You know, did you steal that gum or did you steal that? And then it just tells me everything. And it doesn't really work that way. Like typically the The lie detector is the person. So you sit across from a person, you have a conversation. And as we're discussing something, let's say you're applying to the U.S. Secret Service. We'll make you a recruit. Okay, give it to me. And so we're asking you all these questions about your education, your background, um, drugs, whatever it is. And let's say we get to, I say to you, Louis, did you ever steal anything? And so now I look at... Are there any shifts or any changes? Do you change the direction? No. <laughs> People are usually not that obvious, yeah, yeah. you know, they're, but you can see, you can see something, you can feel it. It's also feeling people. I think that gets dismissed quite a bit that it's not just see here, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's also, you can feel another human the energy. being. Yeah. You can, you, and it's intuitive and you sh- we should allow that and listen to that more rather than shut that down. But it would be, you know, if I would ask you that, I would hear the way you responded. Mm -hmm. Did you respond similarly to all the other questions the same way? Is your, you know, let's say if I said, Louis, did you ever, you know, I asked you all these other historical questions and you're like, no, no, no. And then I say, Louis, did you, have you ever stolen anything? Absolutely not. So now something like that, as small as that, Mm. I may mark that. I was like, okay, he said no, no, no for everything else. But here he said, absolutely not. Interesting. Why is it a bit more emphatic? He oh, cares yeah. more about either protecting something or that it actually isn't the truth. Maybe. And he doesn't want that to be honest. But I will no- notice that it's different. Mm-hmm. That you did something different. Even if you, <clears throat> no. It's, it could be a very subtle thing. Or you might not give me anything. There are some people, and I've had those people where it's just like. Poker face all the way through. Some people, but they'll. I don't want to say they're professional liars, but some people, you know, would come in, especially if it was a criminal case Mm -hmm. and they're guarding their, the truth really hard. And you have to try to figure out what that is. Or some people come in and it's, I swear to God, God, God knows I would never do such a thing. On my grave. Those are usually red flags, unless it's a culture or a person who typically does it. If so, they, if they always say, I swear to God, I swear to my mom then it would be like, look, this is part of this person's natural language, or maybe in their culture, they refer to God quite a bit. But if it's not, and then you start doing that, then again, that's a red flag. So that's what you're really looking for, rather than we have some of these cookie cutter things. It's like, everybody does this, everybody does that. Now, are these things I'm talking about indicators? They, they are, but you may do them and I may not. Mm-hmm. I may do something else. What do you do when you lie? What do I do when I lie? Because we all lie at something, right? At some we do. I do. I do. Small or big. My husband's like, did you, what? you know, have a donut this morning? No. <laughs> I didn't have a donut. What do you lie about the most? Professional or personal? And what in each, each category? 
Maybe like if I'm mad, because I, I have a, I have a pretty I have a pretty bad temper, so it's like oh no I'm fine, yeah. you know, and I, I'll because sometimes I'll know I'm like you know I have a temper, and sometimes I know I'm being irrational, and I don't want to open up a whole conversation, so I'll just be like no yeah. I'm, I'm I'm okay I'll I'll leave it because I'll know it's me. I'm trying to think what do I I lie about? Maybe work if it's a project I don't want to do but you that's what you have agents and managers for because mm -hmm. they do it for you sure they shut it down for you um i'm trying to think i mean we all lie but i try to keep it like usually for me it's like because i'm like a you know i like donuts and i like things cookies Sweets. i do like things Not so my that. husband's like a health fanatic so he'll be like how'd you eat today you know i was, I was like oh this was, was okay yeah. i was i was pretty solid you know oh okay so he'll know what i'm trying to say is there, is there such a thing as person being radically honest all the time? No, I don't. I've not. I've not come across that. But I think here's the thing: it's okay to lie because have you ever been very, very, very honest, maybe with a person, and then felt afterward, you know, I don't. You feel a bit exposed, mm. and you feel like you know, I wish I didn't share this much with this person. Afterward, you kind of have that remorse. Mm -hmm. Because we feel like it's a, it's a protection mechanism. I don't want to tell you everything about me. I don't want to be an open book. Mm. And so I may, and it may not be a lie. So by omission, so in a meeting, if somebody's pitching me a project or I'm talking, talking about something, I don't like it or I don't like the direction it's going. I may not say, I don't like this. I may say, thank you. You know, let me think about that. Meanwhile, I want to, I want to say, no way. I'm not doing it. That's, Terrible. So that that technically would be a lie. I'm yeah. like, you know what? Thank you. I'd let me think about that. Yeah. But I know I can't respond the first way. Shuts people down. That's why I, I feel like we hear people say, say no. You know, being able to say no to people more so because a lot of us have. To protect your time, your space, your yes. energy. Yeah. And that's wonderful. But don't say no. Find other ways to say no. No is ugly. No mm. is mean. No is hurtful. So I can say, thank you so much, I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure if I'm able to, let me think on that. Find alternative ways to let people down. Why is that? Why not? To preserve the relationship. Because when you say no to someone, even if it's a friend, they it might stings. take it personally. It stings, right? Why are you saying no to me? Mm -hmm. Why do you have to say like that? You can say, you can reject people in a thoughtful way, in a professional way, and it, it just, it depends. Like, do you care about the relationship? And if you do, your no, your hard no, can hurt people's feelings. People become sensitive because you're rejecting them. Mm. And so I'm gonna think of a different way to say no that's not gonna impact you as much. It's really using language thoughtfully. Mm. So for example, you brought up lying, I love that. And you said, you know, when I was a kid, I lied. So I would never say to you, Louis, you're a liar. Or Lewis, no, Lewis, you're lying to me. I would say, Lewis, I know you're not being truthful with me. Mm. Lewis, you're holding something back from me. Sounds different. Mm. So it's the same way with language. We don't, we throw our words out and we don't realize that they land on someone. Yeah. And so then we scratch our heads, heads wondering, why did this conversation not go well? It's this person's the problem. When we don't have the ability to think about how did I deliver this? So if it's a business relationship that's important to you, but you want to say no to this, you want to think of a great way to say no. Mm -hmm. So we want to think about how do we let people down without hurting their identity, mm. going back to identity. What's the formula or process to get people to do things just because they feel like it? Well, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's going to sound stupid. Yeah. <laughs> smiling, being smiling. nice. Yeah. So, smiling, uh, neuroscience behind a smile. If you smile at somebody, you actually hit their mirror neurons, you start a smile in their brain. Wow. Smile is an involuntary response. A mirror neur neurons. Mirror neurons in their brain. It's the same as if the doctor hits your knee with a little hammer and your, your leg kicks forward. You didn't choose to have your leg kick forward, it's an involuntary response. So if somebody sees you and you smile, you've instantly hit their mirror neurons, you started a chemical change. Now they might fight it, and sometimes you gotta get them three smiles. <laughs> right. But by a third smile, you get them smiling too. Yeah. So you've already started the process. And then 
your inner voice betrays your outer voice. When you say, how are you to somebody at the Starbucks, your inner voice is saying, I'm trying to make your day better. I, 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 I want you to be a happier person. They're going to feel it. If your inner voice is saying like, how are you today? I need my Starbucks coffee and I need to get out of here and I hate this line and I hate how long you guys, if that's in your voice, they're going to feel that. They're going to be pouring decaf in mm-hmm. instead, of, instead of the other kind. Right. So your entire approach, the neuroscience shows us the person is picking it up mm-hmm. and responding. And so your body language, your tone of voice, the greatest negotiators in the world really maximize that Mm -hmm. because it's an invisible skill. Yeah. But it's a skill you can teach, it sounds like. And learn. And learn. You can teach it. You can learn it. You can practice it. All you got to do is get your your repetitions in. Um, uh, John Foley's a Blue Angel pilot. I heard him speak about four years ago. He talked about how long does it take to build a habit? How much training do you need? He called it grooving a, uh, putting a groove in your brain. The Blue Angels, you know, they got to build their habits before they get up in the sky. Otherwise, the jets crash. I was in a Blue Angel two years ago. It was crazy, man. That had to have been an adrenaline it ride. Was cr- I threw up twice in the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I was sick the whole time and sick for three days afterwards. I've got a weak stomach. But uh, it was unbelievable at the same time they needed to know what they were doing oh for sure they can't learn up there right it's amazing to watch them so close just like feet away from each other at at, at mach one or however fast four they're going. or five whatever yeah it's crazy yeah all right so foley said how do they get that good they practice he said 63 to 64 repetitions to put it in your brain mm. and um another guy wrote the talent code daniel coyle yeah um, he, he talked about perfect practice. Yep. You could go excruciatingly slow as long as you do it right. And the first time you try any skill, you probably go slow. Yeah. You come to one of uh, the training sessions that my company puts on. I'm going to say, say this word for word. Take your time. Mm. And then react in the moment. We have a, one of the negotiation tools is what we call a label. When I say something to you, I want you to label it. I don't care if you have to stare at me for 10 minutes. Label it. Label it. It seems like, it sounds like, it looks like. A label is a verbal observation. Okay. But I need you to use those exact words. And if I say, I love teaching negotiations. Now, label my emotion. Your emotion? The emotion that I displayed when I said, I love teaching negotiations. Label that. What do you say, the three things? It seems like, it sounds like, or it looks like. Label Say it. all three of them? It, just pick one of those three. Say, all right, I'm going to say it again, and yeah. I want you to say word for word, it sounds like, and then fill in the blank. Okay. I love teaching negotiation. It sounds like you love teaching negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's enough. Now, to start with, what just happened is you demonstrated it perfectly. Okay. Because the important part is you have to say the first three words. Mm. That actually fires the brain. Mm. And you did exactly what I thought you would do. We just said it sounds like you fired the brain and then you opened yourself up to whatever your brain put in. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted you to actually say the words, the actual specific words. Because your brain will kick into gear and say something. Now, your, your first label, every time you fire the synapse, you get a little bit better. Mm. There's a substance called myelin. Your brain wraps a substance. It's an electrical synaptic connection in your brain. And anybody, you know, if you know anything about electricity, every time you insulate it, it fires a little bit better. Mm. Fire it 63 to 64 times, according to the Blue Angel pilot, and you get a nice circuit built. Yeah. And it'll fire quickly. And then you'll start to hear it. So we'll fire it again. Okay. And I want you to label it again. I love teaching negotiation. Sounds like you love teaching negotiation. All right. Now dig a little bit deeper. Explain it more? No, no, no. Just another label, but use another adjective. It sounds like teaching. It sounds like X. I love teaching negotiation. It sounds like you're passionate about teaching negotiation. There you go. See? Perfect. Yeah. (laughs) Now you came up with another word. Uh-huh. Now it stumped you for a second. Yeah. 
and you you kicked in you you know you you let that supercomputer come up with another word uh -huh. and like yeah i am passionate about it now interestingly enough this is a way in a business negotiation because mm -hmm. a great business deal is an alignment of core values just like a great personal relationship is an alignment of core values mm -hmm. i'm sitting on a, on a on a plane flying in here this morning i found out more about the guy sitting on a plane next to me than he's told anybody in 20 years mm -hmm. with this same kind of an exercise. What do you do for a living? What do you love about it? And when he, when he tells me, I now know, the guy sat next to him on a plane, he's got an adopted daughter. Uh, she was adopted when she was six months old from China. His mother struggled with uh, bipolar manic depressive. She committed suicide at age 17. Mm -hmm. He was raised by his grandparents, his grand father survived the depression his grandfather at one point in time going into the depression owned 11 banks that all went bankrupt he had to start completely over again his grandfather used to tell him mm. i lost 11 fortunes his grandfather loved to live off the land they loved to they loved to make things by hand this guy's a very successful contractor here in los angeles now. Mm. and he's constantly 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 working on improving himself um Married to his first wife, uh, they're, they're business partners, they work together, they work in different aspects of the business. I mean, I've lost track of the number of things I found out about yeah. this guy. I know, I know about this guy from when he was three years old <laughs> to now. Now, in the space of what sounded like a normal social conversation, I know this guy's incredibly loyal. He's very practical. Mm. He's very hardworking. He, I just, I just flew in from Vegas. He was in Vegas because he was in a competitive poker tournament. Mm. He likes reading people. Mm. He's a very hard worker. From what I know from this guy, from what this perceived social conversation, I know that we could do business together. And if we run into trouble, I have a pretty good idea of what to expect from him and how to deal with those problems if we run into trouble. Wow. With the very sort of thing that you and I did just now. Wow. You know, you start... So when, he, when you ask stuff out, so when you ask him a question and he says something, you would use one of those responses. It seems like, like it yeah. sounds like, or is it there one? Yeah, or it feels like. It feels like. It looks like it could be. It looks like because like, I, I might be reading your body language. It looks it's like, like you're not that interested into it, even though you said you were. Your body yeah. language tells me something different. Exactly. Yeah. And then and then see if you see that in somebody's body language. Your point before about Starbucks about actually seeing uh -huh. a person. That same thing is going on. And they might not even know it. You know, every now and then I get people go like, yeah, you know, I've been struggling with this for a while. Mm. I'm really, I'm really conflicted about it. And they find themselves opening up because, yeah. you know, most of the time if you see conflict in somebody, most people say, ah, it'll be fine. Just keep working hard. It'll be right, fine. Right. It's all part of the journey. <laughs> right. Instead of actually being a great sounding board for somebody and, and helping them sound it out, consequently learning a lot about that person at the same time. It sounds like you're going through a lot right now. It sounds like you're having a hard time with this. It sounds yeah. like. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or, and, and, and it, it's exactly right. And you start to become a tremendous sounding board for people. So what happens to that person when you respond in one of those three or four ways of it sounds like, feels like, uh, looks like, what does that person feel on the other side when you're showing that type of compassion or empathy? They feel connected with. Wow. They feel very connected with, they, they feel <clears throat> seen. You know, they feel like they're a person on the planet. They feel like suddenly they're not just another part of the thundering herd that nobody's paying any attention to. Yeah. They feel at least that. Um, last week we are doing a training with some, some, some pretty tough business people. And one of the guys in this exercise He's saying, like, I found myself talking about stuff that happened when I was seven years old. Wow. He said, I got to tell you something. I feel transformed right now. And so we stopped the group at that point in time. And we said, all right, so now, based on Larry talking about that sort of a change, what kind of a guy is he to deal with? Mm. He's a pretty decent guy. Yeah. You now have caught a glimpse into him as more as a total human being, which means... If he does something that you perceive to be a negative move, he did it accidentally or you misinterpreted it. 
which means it's okay to go back to them instead of you know, letting the rage build up in you because you misinterpreted something or did it by accident. He's a decent guy. If he, if he slighted you, he did it by accident. Right. You can go back to him and bring it up and say, hey, I got to tell you, I got a problem with this. Mm. He's probably going to open up because just based on this real, this three minute exercise, you found out about. He opened up then, so you'd probably, yeah. He's a decent human being. And every human being is going to hurt you, principally inadvertently. So you can go back to them and, and, and find out what's behind it and make them aware because they're going to want to know. Yeah. Every human being is going to hurt you? Everybody, one way or another, is going to do something accidentally or on purpose that's going to hurt your feeling. Mm-hmm. We're, going to, we're going to interpret it as negative the vast majority of the time. Yeah. When in fact it was probably a complete accident. There's a really good chance they got no idea they hurt your feelings. Right. You need to know which one it was. Mm -hmm. Did they do it on purpose? Do they know they did it? The numbers are that they did it by accident, and the other numbers are there's a really good chance they didn't know they did it. Right. You know, I went I went to uh, you know a landmark forum a couple Mm -hmm. of years ago. Yeah. Talking about making amends with people, talking to people who've hurt you, and so one of the young ladies. Did you go through uh, the whole program? Yeah. One of the young ladies in it was like, you know, when I was seven, this, a girl who was my cousin, you know, you know they, they bullied me. You know, they said something that hurt me. I, you know, it's 30 years. I haven't let go. Wow. So we talked about it. They talked about it. And she said she went, she decided to go to the person and just, because to forgive, to forgive is to let go. You know, not forgiving is like taking poison and hoping the other person dies, yeah, right? Yeah. You've heard that. Yeah. So she goes to this girl. And she says, I want you to know I forgot. The girl didn't even remember. She got no what? memory. She was just being a stupid kid at the yeah. time. She had, you know, we're they were stupid they, at seven, right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're joking around. And, they're, and wow. so she held they, on to it for that long. 30 years, the other person doesn't even know it. So and by nature, we're joking around with somebody and we accidentally say something that wounded them. Mm-hmm. If they don't feel they can talk to us, they're going to carry it for 30 years. Yeah. If I heard, if I heard somebody, I want to know. Yeah. You know, I because I'm, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm an idiot. You know, yeah. I, had no, I had no idea I did that to you. Yeah. I had no idea. Was there anything from the emotional intelligence training at Landmark that added to your curriculum of negotiations that you didn't already know or use before? The, the, well, not because it's all inter, interwoven. The biggest thing that jumped out at me is it, it occurred to me that somebody hurt somebody else without even knowing they did it. Like in in a, in, a, in a master class thing, you know, they did a great job. The master class people are phenomenal. Yeah. So we're wandering to the very tail end of it, and they got me talking about this guy that bullied me when I was a kid. You. They yeah. Got you talking about yeah. Yeah. And and I had I had I had literally never told anybody about this. <clears throat> wow. So you know it's and it happened when I was a little kid. Yeah. I literally had never told anybody about it. Not even through landmark or anything else. Nothing. Wow. And they get it out of me at master class. They, they catch me off guard over it, you know, and it's to, to, to this day, this is one of the reasons why I hate bullies. You know, I want to become an FBI agent because, you know, we, we want to go after the bad guys because the bad guys are bullies. And there's nothing I like better than getting a bully that's victimizing somebody else. Mm. And I think it was instilled in me in what happened when I was, when I was a kid. But then I started comparing that to this this interaction I heard at Landmark where somebody bullied somebody else and they didn't even know they did it. Mm. And then I began thinking about it, like, how many people have I hurt that I didn't even know? Right. Like, if they would have come up to me today and said, you heard you know, I've carried this for 40 years. And I have to have done that to somebody. Right. Have to have I done know that I to have. somebody. Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, the, this, this forgiveness thing is a two-way street and, all, and also being, being, you know, who, who do I need to go back to that I could think of? Mm. That I and, and say, look, look, uh, since I know that inadvertently I'm a jerk, <laughs> then I, what did I do? Right. I'm sure I did something. I had to have done something. Then it's an, it's an interesting dilemma, all, all sort of part of, you know, being a better person anyway, which yeah. I know is what, what you're dedicated to. It's almost, it seems like it's really hard, especially if you're a public figure that has an audience that you're going to say something or do something that's going to offend or hurt someone. Right. 
at all the times. Yeah. It's like you're always going to be offending someone if you have a voice. If you're right. sharing something, your, your point of view. Right. So your point of view is going to reach a certain audience's point of view, but not the rest of the world's point of view. So it's like you're always hurting people, aren't you? Yeah. And at some and, level, you're like offending, hurting, or frustrating and people. And their hurt's going to be defensive in reaction. Yeah. Or, or they misinterpret, or, or you, you hit a button with them yeah. that you didn't even, you had, maybe you didn't hit the button, but you came close to a button that's been hurt before. <laughs> close. And, you know, and interestingly enough, we see this a lot with the procurement people that come to our training. I'm really careful to say, look, look, I know you guys fear procurement. And, and this is about dealing successfully with procurement. Mm -hmm. And we had one person in the training go, I work in procurement and you criticized, you said procurement people were bad. I said, not, as a matter of fact, that's not what I said. But I came so close to your hot button that it hit it anyway. Yeah. And I spent some time with this woman and she was afraid that that was what I meant. And, but di didn't know how to approach me. Yeah. And when it came up subsequently, I said, no, as a matter of fact, procurement has one of the most difficult jobs on the planet. You guys are both, you spend your days either herding cats or getting chased by villagers with pitchforks. Right. You know, it's one or the other. Yeah. And she was like, yeah. Yeah, it's really tough. I was just afraid that that's what you meant. Mm. It was that amygdala that we were talking about before, yeah. the 75% negative. Yeah. We're all equipped with that. And when someone even comes close to a criticism, then we're afraid that that's what they mean and they're hurt. How do you take criticism? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really been good at it until, I wouldn't say I've mastered it. I think I've gotten better. Uh, over the last six years, I started to really like say, okay, let me not react to this criticism. Like they probably have some good intention. They're trying to tell me, and maybe there's some truth there. So let me start to listen to the feedback or the criticism and say, okay, how can I be better? Is there any truth in there that really resonates or are they coming from a place of anger of their own thing? Criticism is mostly fear driven. By so, the person criticizing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it, you, you criticize that in point of fact, you've been hurt, you've been disappointed, you've been frustrated. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of things that, you know, never take advice from anybody you wouldn't share places with. Criticism is a form of advice, but you're afraid to tell people how to do stuff. So you just criticize what they do. Mm -hmm. Some people, and then they get, it becomes an addiction for some people. Criticism is not a great behavior. I, I know you've heard the phrase, Nobody's doing better than you will ever criticize you. Right. They'll mentor you. Right. So, first of all, how do I take criticism? It, I got to take a step back and understand if somebody's coming at me with just a criticism, even if they ask permission to criticize, they got, some, they got struggles that are worse than mine. Right. If they, and if they ask you to give you criticism... I'm, I be, you know, they are an open wound at that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say, yeah, sure, go ahead. Right. I'm, I'm gonna, f they've already told me they're probably coming from a difficult place. Gotcha, gotcha. So what I'm gonna try to do is just kind of take it easy on them mm -hmm. and understand where they're coming from. Um, a blog I'm a big fan of, Eric Barker writes this great blog, yeah. Barking Up the Wrong yeah, Tree. Yeah, that's great. Eric told me one time for every, Every hater, there's going to be 10 people that are on your side. Mm -hmm. So when a critic comes up to me, I see that as there are 10 people. You're indicating to me that I'm successful with nine other people. And I'm not going to get down on this person yeah. because it's very easy to get down on them. Because unfortunately, they're coming from a negative place. Yeah. Gotcha. That's good to know. What's a role playing exercise that anyone can do with a friend? Um, that would make them a better negotiator. In Try to general. get whoever you're talking to to say the magic two words, that's right. Which means you got to summarize where they're coming from. If you, hmm. in, in any given interaction, if you got a point <laughs> you want to make, yeah. before you make it, your trigger, you're not allowed to make your point. So give me an example. Um, and you want the other person you're role-playing with to say, that's right. Okay, so 
You were telling me about critics. Yeah. You're a high profile guy. You're about helping other people, which means you get criticized a lot. That's right. <laughs> and when you get criticized, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't say you're empathic, although you are. Mm-hmm. I would say you're probably more compassionate. Those are two different things. Mm. Empathy is, you have to have empathy to be compassionate, but empathy is not compassion. Compassion is the next step. Empathy is a compassionate thing to do, genuinely understanding somebody. But there's a real fine line there, they're distinct things. And I think you have a tremendous amount of compassion for people. So you know that when someone criticizes you, they're attacking you. Mm. But you also know that they've been hurt and they're struggling. So you want to know how to respond to them and have them better as a result of the interaction instead of coming back and making them feel worse. And you struggle with that because you're under attack mm-hmm. and you try not to you try not to fire back at them. Right. Yeah, that's right. They, <laughs> so you want to have a conversation with someone. If you could summarize their point of view first. Uh, summarize the other person's, when, when you summarize the other, what the other person's struggling with. In, in any type of deal making. In any type of a deal. A business deal, a relationship, a buying coffee, upgrading, whatever it is. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Then after that, you can make your point. Interesting. Make a point or make your proposal or, or yeah, or whatever. So if you're trying you're, to get an upgrade at a, if you're trying to get an upgrade on an airport, uh, you know, on a plane or at a hotel. Right. Or trying to get a supersize me for free. Right. You're trying to get some type of upgrade for free. Right. Would you do the same thing? Would you say, I know you're going through, it seems like it's been a long day for you. Well, you can look at them and tell whether or not it's going to be a long day. So right off the bat, you say long day. Right. And then as, as soon as you get ready to make your ask, what's their and this instinctive response, their knee-jerk reaction, what's that going to be? When I make an ask? Once you've made your ask, uh-huh. what's their, of, of somebody's trying to get something for free, Yeah. what's their typical knee-jerk reaction? Oh, this person's just trying to get something for free from me? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, and everyone does this or everyone- There you, know, you go. Everyone's doing this. Yeah, so you walk up and you go like, hey, look, man, I know I, I'm going to seem like just another jerk who's trying to get something for free. Mm. Somebody who treats you like you were their servant. Oh, man. Somebody who doesn't care about you, could care less whether you live or die. They only care that you're, long, you're alive long enough to make my coffee. Because that's what the other guy's thinking. Mm. How do you articulate what they're thinking, especially the negative stuff about you? When you say that, they're going to be like, no, 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 no. But what you did was you just woke them up. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, woke, you snapped them out of the negative loop that's in their head because the last guy come in and said, yeah, I want it and I want it now. And I hate waiting in line to start. <laughs> do you do this all the time, all day long? Are you constantly well, in the game of negotiation with people? It's, uh, it's that, you know, that I brush my teeth today mm-hmm. just because I brushed them yesterday. You know, I, 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 de- I genuinely... I got to keep my skills up because yeah, it's practice. either stay even, decline, or get better. <clears throat> I want to keep my skills up. The mercenary in me does it because I got to keep my skills up. The missionary in me does it because I actually care about people. When I talk about another dimension, like you guys think different than most people think. Well, we reverse engineer. Yes. So my work as an engineer, I don't, I could barely screw in a light bulb. My, my right. wife makes fun of me. But the way that I think, the way that we, like the way that I dissect my routines is I first think of the effect. So I think, what do I want you to, to think see. happened, mm. right? Here's what would be really cool to me. So it'd be really cool to me if I could tell you to think of anyone, but I'm influencing where you're going to go with that person before you even know it. And I'm going to tell you that person's name. And I'm yeah. gonna, Don't so, make it an athlete. That's too obvious. Exactly. Don't make it this. That's, oh, so, okay, narrow it down. Psychology yes. 101. Yeah. It's the same way that a salesperson, if they're very mm-hmm. pushy, the used car salesman says, mm-hmm. you get this car, get this car, your guard is up. Yeah. But if you walk into a place and they kind of talk to you long, they go, you know what? This might not be right for you. I'm going to, I think maybe your business is better elsewhere. You're intrigued. Mm-hmm. This guy doesn't want my money. What do you mean? That's how you hook people in. There's so many little 
facets. Yeah. yeah. There's interesting thing. Pickup artist. Did you ever see that book by uh, by Neil Strauss? Yeah, Neil yeah, Strauss. I know him the very game. Well. He's a good friend of mine. So a lot of those guys started as magicians, and a lot of what they talk about mm. uh, is very applicable to what I do, literally. But not for picking up, you know, picking up like girls right, or anything. Right. It's knowing how people think in their decision making, knowing how social dynamics work, mm. how people think when they're one at a time or versus in a group dynamic, and I. You know, I work on that all the time. That's really? so much of my show is knowing how I'm going to affect and influence somebody when they're mm. amongst others. When somebody is with their peers, colleagues, or whether they're with their boss, all of those things play in when I do a show. Really? Oh, yeah. Huge. So when you see someone, when you go into a room or a restaurant and you're thinking like, when you see someone, do you think like, what's the trick or I mean, what's the, the thing I want to do? Not the trick, but the, you know, the thing Jason that I do Bourne. Them. You know Jason Bourne, the first movie? One of my yes. favorite scenes ever is when they bring him into the restaurant and he tells you so everything you right this, now. This, this, Boom, this. I know what that guy's wearing. I know yes. what that license plate is. I know that. That no BS is exactly what I've trained my mind to do. In They're, every room. Every, if I walk into most rooms, like I had a show last night for 85 people in San Antonio, Texas, I knew every single person's name in that room, every single person's first name. How? Well, that, that's memory work. So I've oh. worked on memory. So you, you, you met every person. Well, during the cocktail hour, I walk around, I say I hello. You. I you met everyone. Yeah. I even if I don't meet them, they have name tags. Wow. I know. I, I'm going to know everything about them. I know who worked for the host company. I know who didn't. I know who's wow. superior to who. And I've got the social dynamics on this. Wow. This guy's got a wedding band. You know, I can see that it's scuffed. I know this guy's been married probably 15, 20 years. I everything like that is fodder for the show. Sure. That's just a, additional stuff. You're just like, wow, this guy's good. That is the show. Yeah. So when you hear about cold reading and stuff mm-hmm. that a lot of psychics and mediums do. I'm not here to tell you what's real and not real. I just know that so much of what I see a lot of psychics do, I could do exactly the same right. and I could do it with no supernatural abilities. I can do it based on the here, the now, my five senses and what I'm able to yeah, do. Asking a couple questions and yeah, just uh, being aware leading of- Leading questions, yes. knowing where people's motivations are. I know that they want to hear a certain thing, so I'm going to bring them in that direction. It's kind of like if I knew one thing about you. Let's say, Lewis, I learned one thing about you. Let's say I knew exactly that you were going to think uh, about your brother who's uh, you know, a mm-hmm. world-known jazz violinist, number one in the world. What I might do is mention my siblings and go into that and then have a facet where I ask somebody else in here to think of their sibling. And then I wait that moment and I kind of put the hook in. And I know that I've just said it where you're going to go, well, what does my brother do? And I know that information. Everything I've done is craft a scenario right. that's going to set in motion you asking me the question that I know the answer to. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, Everything you do is setting up what you already know. Uh, not always, but mm. I try to do multiple different. So I have that would be if I did that more than once, you would instantly catch on. Right. So what I do is I mix methods. In my show, I teach you how I did one thing slightly, and then I do the same thing in a totally different way, and you go, what the F? <laughs> so that's the fun of it. If yeah. I did a show and you didn't understand anything, you would get very bored and you'd get exasperated and annoyed with me. I like to spread breadcrumbs. The whole show, I teach you little things, really? takeaways, and that's why you have fun. Mm. Yeah. So you're teaching people what you're doing as you're doing it. Absolutely. You're like elements to, of it. You're not trying to like hide the magic of it. Oh, no. I, I will show people how to detect lies during the show. Wow. And, and so I'll, I'll do things, body language reads. I'm not teaching you to be a mentalist, right. but I'm giving away a little bit of the craft while I go because that's what hooks you in. You go, yeah. wow. And so as it gets better, Every phase gets a little more impressive, and then you do something even crazier. You go, well, if he did that, how did he do that one? It just makes it more fun. You need to build. Mm, sure, sure. Um, does mentalism have to do more with emotional intelligence or observing people's behavior? So it has to do with both in the same way that a hypnotist, if you say to me, I don't want to be hypnotized, I don't want to be hypnotized, I'm not going to be hypnotized, right. then at the end of the day, you won't be hypnotized. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The power of suggestion. Uh-huh. So... <clears throat> But a hypnotist, a very talented, good one, can diffuse that person's underlying tension or why are they so nervous or what are they scared of or what's the problem. So in in most scenarios, I try to get to the root of will this person be good to work with or not. And when I'm doing a big show, I can quickly avoid people that I just don't really? think are going to be fun. Right. Because some people, if let's say – I walk up to you and you just had a really rough day or you got really bad news. And I don't want that. I don't ever want to bring up – my show is not ever going to bring <clears> you bad news. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a fun show. It's interactive. So I'll kind of shy away from that. Yeah. But to answer the question, I think that it's more about observing people than the emotional intelligence because certain people, I just can't read well. There's no really? way around it. Yeah, like so I can do certain things with them, but we won't get to the next level with them. It's just that simple. There's no way around it. And, and then they'll come up to me in the show and be like, well, why didn't you do something more with me? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I couldn't. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, 
I couldn't oh, read your mind. Yeah, you exactly open. right. Yeah. Exactly right. It was a bit what, more um, opaque than others. So what's the perfect person to work for with? Or who do you see? What's the type of person you see? You're like, yes, that's going to be a good person to work with. It, it, what are it the runs the gamut of the extreme. So the people that are most believing and most into it are always the most so fun. Like, and also the ones that are at the opposite end that are the most skeptical. Because mm. nothing's better Their than arms somebody. Cross yeah, and, like, arms crossed, body guy. language like this. And I seek them out in the show. I have a yeah. lot of funny bits that are just literally finding yeah. that person that, that's going to say, there's no way you're going to know this. And that's the best moment ever when you get that right. Because that's when you get the explosive reactions on stage, mm. on TV. And the ones like the David Blaine things where you just know in today's day and age where everything can be faked, everything can be reshot. But authenticity can't be faked. Like when you see someone's real reaction, you know it's not actors. You know yeah. it's you just can't fake it. It's yeah. very difficult to fake surprise and being blown away. Mm. People can notice when it's when it's off. You know? Yeah, of course they can. Is there ever a what do you call it? If you don't you don't call it a trick, but do you call it something else? Trick, routine, effect, routine. whatever you want. Is there ever an, an I don't mind trick. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm tricking you, but right. my goal isn't the trick. Right. It, it, if you figure out how I did it, some of the time, it's more impressive than actually not knowing. Really? There's certain things I do where when you know, if you actually figure it out, somebody will walk up to me and goes, you couldn't have possibly done this and this. And I go, that's exactly what I did. And he goes, there's no way. He <laughs> goes, that's insane. So it's some of the things wow. are even more impressive once you figure them out because they seem so ballsy. They go, there's, right. you just did that in front of thousands of people. Like that could have gone wrong. What right. if, what if? And I go, that's exactly, that's the rush. Have you ever done a big performance where everything's gone wrong? Never everything. But like a big trick maybe that you know you, you always do really well or that always goes well and then it's like this big aha and then no, that wasn't what I was thinking about. Oh, 100%. Really? So, oh, yeah, for sure. How do you deal with that? So it depends where I'm dealing with it. Oh. So let's say when I do a stage show, like a corporate event or somebody's hiring me for a private party, the one thing I have of the luxury of is time, okay? So here's what I mean by that. Mm. I, I, imagine a director's cut of a movie. Let's say you get to watch the three alternate endings – you didn't even know that could happen. You go, wow, I didn't even know. So in some situations, the only reason you know what the ending is is if I frame the ending, okay? So something could go wrong that you don't even know went wrong. You don't know because I didn't say it's not an A to B. It's not think of something and I'm going to guess it. So if I can reframe, just re reframe uh. something, then you don't even know it went wrong. We just move in a different direction and pivot. And suddenly that goes right and you think that other thing didn't even matter. Was, Do you understand yeah, what I mean? It's all the way that I frame so it. You could have ended it originally, but it, you realize that like, oh, this isn't the end. So I need to go somewhere else. Correct. If you didn't know, the reason you expect it is let's say um, – if, if I you said this is the final thing and here we go. <laughs> if I tell you in advance what's going to happen, if right, I say right. you say this and here's an envelope and look what's inside, you're expecting it to be that. Right. But what if it's not that? What if it's something from earlier and we then go to – do you understand there's different facets? Sure. On TV, it's very different. Yeah, how did and you I do, do that? I do a lot of live TV now. I, yeah. I'm on the Today Show every month. I do quite – I was on ESPN. You say I pretty yes. much do usually – Knock on wood, I've been doing about two or three national TV appearances a month lately. Congrats. Thank you. It's amazing. So, but you got to have kind of the end because you only got oh, like five minutes. Oh, that, you couldn't be more right. There's a clock ticking. And when so. something goes wrong, and a lot of the stuff I do is very risky. And a lot of other mentalists, that, like my friends, that will say to me, like, why are you doing that, man? And I go, because I, I like to live on the edge. Like big, big risk, big reward. Right. Where I will tell somebody, think of something, and I go, right now, change your mind to another thing. And it's like it, they know that there's, there's just no – there's no safety net. If at that moment I don't push them and they don't go to what I want them to do, then there's no outs. Like I did this thing with Al Roker where I had him think of any celebrity. And I said, who's going to run for president in 2020? Just make someone up right now. And he goes, George Clooney, right? And then I said to him, I go, what if you change your mind right at this moment, picked anybody else? What if it was somebody else? He goes, I don't know. I go, just anyone. And he goes, Taylor Swift. And I Took off my shirt and I had a picture of Taylor Shut Swift up. for 2020. And you did it, not. It was, I'll show you the clip. And they, it, they were so freaked out that they couldn't do the next segment. And they bumped <laughs> the next person who I saw in the green room. And she was so mad at me. Oh, like, my so gosh. Sorry. And they kept me on. And they just kept saying, like, how did you – and Al was – and I, I since know them because we've developed quite a relationship sure, in the sure. last year. But to this day, he goes, that's the one. He goes, because in that moment, wow. I could have said anything I wanted. And he goes, you were wearing a shirt. And then I told him the joke. I go, I was wearing George Clooney underwear. Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, but no, it was it's that kind of stuff is in the moment. My heart is racing. What if he doesn't say it? But I'm super calm. That's like all the it's kind of like when I line up at the race day, all my nerves are gone once yes. I start running. Once I get in the zone, if I am too nervous and I don't believe it, then it won't happen. 
And I of know course. that sounds no, ridiculous, but the visualization, the I'm sure you know Usain Bolt, Michael Phelps, they did their races a thousand times in their mind Absolutely. before that gun went off. So in my mind, every single scenario, I'm so focused in that moment when I'm on TV and I know that millions of people are watching that if I don't believe it's going to happen, it might not. It's not going to happen. I swear. So I, how long I were you swear. thinking about this uh, routine? With Al, with Al, how long were you thinking? It was just like a couple of days before, weeks uh, before. Yeah, probably. I mean, most of them, it's they, you don't really have. Uh, it's not like one of those things where you tell you're going to be on two months from now. They're like on Monday. They're like, hey, we want you for Wednesday. Pretty much. It's yeah. usually about a let's call it seven to ten day notice. So you think about it. Yeah. And are you thinking this is what I want him to say? This is where I. Oh I'm, yeah. I'm gonna I mean, wear this shirt. It was very. And he's clear gonna cut. say Taylor Swift. He better. And are you going over in your mind, like just visualizing it for the whole yes. week? Like, oh, this is what I'm going to say to set him up. This is where he's going to go. He's all the time. Say, Every really? run, all the time, thinking about tweaking it, thinking about where it, will he think. I just know. Imagine just one of those. I don't know what those. What are those charts where you, this goes to that and yeah. this goes to that. It's like a spider chart. <clears throat> yes. So I'm eliminating all of those branches by what I'm saying and the way I'm influencing him, the way I'm tapping wow. him. And like, I know right when he thought of that, when I tapped him, he just went away from that. And oh, yeah, it's just <laughs> layers on layers. It's like in Inception almost. Wow. Uh, that's man. what I try to do. So, how did you set it up for him? Oh, uh, you know, watch it later. I, oh I, my uh, gosh, man. A video is worth a thousand words. Yeah. Because if I tell you, you just won't, people won't believe it. You won't, when you see it. I'll believe it. Yeah. I'll be- <laughs> yeah it, it, it's that's mostly amazing. It sounds man. too BS when I tell it. Now, is it more about you believing it in your mind and seeing it actually happen? Or is it more about what you say, your touch, your what you don't say? All of it. All of it. Yeah. So you're thinking about every element of how to influence him to say Taylor Swift. Yes, 100%. Wow. <laughs> this is fascinating, man. Um, let's... I, it's still, with all that due diligence and all that work, I still can't get my wife to say the restaurant I want to go eat at. <laughs> I'm like, where do you want to eat? She's like, anywhere you want. And I'm like, sushi? She's like, no. Then I'll say like four more things, and then she'll finally be like, no, I want this. I'm like, why didn't you tell me from the start? Even a mentalist has the same issues that all the rest of the mortals have. So <laughs> sure, sure. That's why I married her. I have no idea what she's thinking. That's funny. Now, um, have you ever done something on TV where it went wrong? Where yeah. you like, where you had the Taylor Swift shirt underneath or it's whatever the shirt is? It's never been that, that They were like, deep. The hooks Donald Trump, and deep. you're like, um... So it's <laughs> now what it's so I I mean it will happen in wristband with it <laughs> yeah that will be my last TV appearance right yeah. but no it will invariably um it will happen one day but for the big ones for the big reveals like the stuff that's like the end point it's never been that and even then to be honest the thing with Al Roker I didn't know he was gonna say George Clooney first I really? swear to you I swear to you you could that 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 was at that moment that was as laser focused you try to get and, him to say something else first. Why want him to say Taylor Swift the first time? Of course. Oh, yeah. And then so, you said switch it. I, well, you didn't know that that would be the case. You didn't know that was obviously part of it. if I had the you shirt. needed to. Yes. So at that point, for us, for me to say to him, I go, "What if I go in this very moment? Look at me, change your mind. Anyone else that you could ever think of in 2020?" And he went to her. And so to so be you honest, could do that maybe like two more times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm like, uh, uh, <laughs> no, go someone else. Hillary, who else? Who else? <laughs> you know, it was we were on the clock. And he goes, you have 45 seconds left when I was doing something for them. It's oh an amazing gosh. moment. And I had about 15 seconds to do it with him. And I ripped off the shirt, almost like popped the buttons when I revealed it. But if you um, if you watch it, it was just at that moment it was just laser focus where I like wow. had to really like Vulcan mind melt, look him right in the eye and say, if you change your mind right now, who would you change to? And he goes like this. He's like exasperated. He goes, I don't know. I go, just anyone. He goes, Taylor Swift. And it was just, it made it must it have the- felt so good. You're just like, ah. And, 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 like, it's not even a rush like my stomach dropped everything oh my yeah. god so to answer your question it hasn't happened yet but even in the moments when it's been close i've been able to find wow. a way but it will one day it will one day oh wow man i'm gonna have to watch that one and see um let's bring in let's bring in uh get matt Sa- or matt, first. matt either one either one bring them both in okay so for those who are just listening you're gonna want to go to the youtube channel and watch this right now um but you'll still you'll you'll understand what's gonna happen matt is here caesar is here next to me and then o's is across from matt so go ahead so i got in here today yes literally from the airport disheveled open up my suitcase and i just started throwing stuff out there imagine planting seeds and i asked you to think not of work but make it like a little more like vacation something that was amazing and I give you some time. Is that right? And you came up with something. Did you come up with something pretty good? Now, I know <laughs> you initially deliberated and you thought of, of, of one trip, a vacation, and you switched your mind, correct? I did. I could tell. The first trip you were thinking of, 
uh, you mentioned, was it a place you've been to more than once? Yes. Okay. And I could tell just based on this, the hand motion, you were there, you weren't alone, you are with other people, and it's somebody close to the heart. So go back to the first thing, the thing you just thought of before you changed your mind, somebody with you, really close to the heart, older, da- this is your dad? Were you thinking of your dad first? You were, right? You were just thinking of your dad. No, no, no. But this is crazy, because then you changed your mind. Am I right? I did. Now, certain people, I told you group dynamics. Matt knows everybody in this room. Yes. So he doesn't feel like he's got to impress you. Some people, right, when I tell right. them, think of a vacation. They're like, oh, crap, I got to really – like if he said Florida, you're going to look at him and be like, that's the best you could do, buddy. <laughs> so, so you probably didn't go with like Tahiti or something nuts. I think you probably did a place you've been to more than once, but like it's just awesome. It's just got a place in your heart. Am I right about this? Yes. Now, you thought of your dad the first time, and so when you changed, you probably went to a female. Plus, you're twiddling your thumbs. You look excited. She's not related to you, is she? Uh, she's not. She is not. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Think of the place. Um, 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 think of where on the planet. So imagine like we spin the globe and uh, I think this is, holy crap, this is somewhere in the U.S., am I right? Is this domestic? Yes, it is. <laughs> and, 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 okay, think, th- <laughs> it is, this is somewhere in California, am I right? Holy, oh man, but it's a good one. There's no way I can know this. The person with you, think of the first letter of her name. Think of the first, don't say, don't say. Listen to this noise, like a chop. It's either a C or a K, am I right? Yes. Okay. Um, 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 how many years back? How many years ago was this trip? Five. Okay, so you went there five years ago, but you've been there more than once. Would this have been like 2012? Am I doing the math right on that, or like more earlier? Earlier. 2000 what, give or take? 10, 11. Okay, which one do you think? Probably 2010. 2010. Yeah, You'll check later. It was actually 2011, but whatever. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 2010 it is. Is there any way that I could have found this out? Is there some way, shape, or form that Lewis, Sarah, anybody in this room could have told me or given this up? I want you guys to see this in my pocket. I'm, I'm reaching in here. Um, I'm going to pull this out. It's stapled. Oh, my gosh. We're at the School of Greatness, <laughs> and I wasn't taking any chances. Prediction. This thing is stapled shut. Can you tell us all it's stapled everywhere? Did I miss a corner? Did I do anything? Seems stapled Was I stapling anything here? Rip it open. No. If it's a photo of you and her there six years ago, I'm kidding. A photo? Our, our camera person's going to faint. People have gotten restraining orders. I know, not a photo. Just humor me. Where was this trip? Santa Barbara. Oh, beautiful place. Read out loud what I wrote, folded, and stapled shut for him. No way. I'm picking, up, I'm picking up a vacation to Santa Barbara that happened in 2010, and someone with you named Kendra. Holy. <laughs> He, give him CPR. He's not breathing. He's starting to sweat. I'm getting clammy. <laughs> what? Yeah. That was it. I even said five years, and then we went back to 2010. <laughs> I went through every one of his albums it's on sweating. Facebook this morning. You have no idea. I have 38 oh other gosh. envelopes all over my body. No, so that his trip to London is chafing my right thigh right now. <laughs> he doesn't even have Facebook. I know, I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> Couldn't even do it with him. Wait, amazing. get Sarah in here. Where's Sarah? Grab Sarah real quick. That's amazing. I want you, please, turn on your phone. <laughs> and and take a step back so there's no way you think I can see or mirrors or anything. And I want you to start scrolling through the names, kind of like you've done a million times before. And what you're seeking out here is this random person of the day. Somebody, you didn't even know why you picked them initially, am I right? Going through, and I see you going up, going down, scouting, looking at this guy, this girl, finally stopping on one specific person. Did you find them? And take your time with it. Is this the person from before? Yeah, yeah, you've got somebody right in mind. Did you even know why you picked this person initially, or was it just totally random? Totally random. Okay. And then put it against your stomach once you found them. This is the person that she picked before, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wait, when I say picked before, it's very no, important. The random, There's no, the random. This is like, there, you the didn't tell pick. anybody. This is no, like no. somebody you just picked out of your phone for no rhyme or reason. The scroll In fact, down. when you first looked, you didn't even look. You were just kind of scrolling at, put it against your body. Now, I can tell it's a guy. Am I right about that? Yes. Now, I don't know how your phone is laid out. I've never seen your phone, touched your phone. You didn't, you didn't write this or whisper this or anything. Like right now, the only way that you have this information is you looked in your own phone. Is that correct? I want to be yeah. sure. Yeah. I watched this too. And, and yes. I didn't tell you, go there, go there. You just went through your phone. Uh, is it a first and last name or is it just the first? First and last. Okay. Think of how many letters 
are in the first name, but don't count it with your mouth. Don't use your fingers. Tell me when you've counted it. Got it. That was instant. Lewis, I call that an instant read. If the wow. name was like Mitchell, that's a struggle, man. M-I-T-C-H. Yeah. That's like, yes. but if the name is really quick. Like Joe. Like a Dan or a Bob or a Bill. Exactly right. <laughs> I think. Wait, why did you smile? Because you laughed when you said one of those words. No. No? That was weird. She laughed at you and got very tense. Oh. No BS. <laughs> what did you just read your mind? Is the name actually Joe? What? Dude, bring it in. School is great. How did you do it? Right? Why? Shut up. The tension, I didn't even read her mind yet. I was just getting there. But she she got very tight and tried to look not serious. And then she looked at you right after. Wait, wait. Go to his last name. No way. There, no, don't say. Put it against your body. Dude, you got, you got the gift, man. Put it against your body. Put it against your body, though. Um. Joe, do you remember his last name? Okay. Let's say that I dump Scrabble tiles right here on the table. And you take them and you spell his last name with the Scrabble tiles. Now, I won't make you count it. Because I see you looked a little confused. You went back and forth, which means the name is long. I want you to imagine you put all the tiles on the table, and you know how the Z has a lot of points, and the Q has a lot of points. I don't care which one you pick up, but I want you to reach down and pick up one of the letters out of the middle. And I want you to come on over and imagine that they're laid out right here, the Scrabble tiles. I want you to pick one up out of the middle. Please pick one up and hold it in your hand. You have a tile in your hand, correct? Now, I saw when you went down. Did you see how she did this? She went like this question that's weird but you didn't know which one to go with which means you either changed your mind or weird question did the letter you pick up is it in the name more than once no okay okay that was because you did that it's a vowel am i right no not a vowel okay okay let me see it think of that letter it's kind of near the end of the name no middle okay okay go back to the Okay, put that down. I really thought it's not an it's not an N, is it? It is an N. Am I right? Yes. Hold the applause. Good idea here. <laughs> Cuz I saw you waver from an N and you were thinking of an E and it's I, I you know what? I know you were about to do it and I don't know if I'm spelling this right. Everyone always gets mad. It's not a spelling bee. It's a mind reading. Can you close your eyes for us, please? Close your eyes. Uh-huh. And I feel like and do we have a, are we zoomed in on that? Yeah. We got a shot. <laughs> Open your eyes. She didn't see. It's like Italian, right? Joe what? Giannetto. Joe Giannetto. <laughs> what? That's crazy. <laughs> wow. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Wow. I'm a believer. Weirdest part, she barely remembers who he is, and he's going to text her in three days. She's going to freak out. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> She's like, do you know Joe? Wow. Joe's going to hear this, and he's going to be like, come on, tweet me back. <laughs> that's oh crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> the name thing, I man, that's just, like, crazy. But a lot of that is, like, also persuasion, right? Mm. A lot of it is also, like, tells and persuasion. Some of it. Oh, Some yeah, the, it. the part yeah. with the letters. I mean, she could have thought of anyone. I know she changed wow. right at the end, and I knew it was a vowel. And, like, people are indecisive sometimes, right? So she yeah, kind of, yes. yeah. Wow, man. This is crazy. Um, what's the one effect that you've always wanted to learn how to do that you've never been able to do yet? So I, there's one thing that I really want to do, which is uh, publicity stunts. So like uh, David Blaine yes. did amazing things where, uh, I mean, things everybody knows about. Like stood on knows, a pole. Exactly. For, like, stood on long? a pole for like 48 hours. Didn't eat for 40 days. So, 40 days didn't eat. Did, that's what they said. Yeah, he was in a glass box in London um, that they kind of, you know, had hanging. And he's just done a lot of these stunts, like being buried alive. And so those types of stunts, I've always wanted to do one. I haven't fully figured it out yet, but mm. I want to do a minor stunt. A Houdini stunt. thing. Not so much. So <clears throat> those stunts, there's two elements that will capture attention, right? Yes. The first one is danger, right? Yes. So, so either you're starving yourself or you're putting yourself, you're shooting a bullet or something where could this go wrong? You know, kind of that same feeling, that mentality when you're at a racetrack where you don't want anyone to get hurt, but you're like, this has that danger element, right? So the other one is if I'm mm. not doing something dangerous, which is things like a Russian roulette. Like uh, in a lot of shows, there's a famous trick that mentalists do where they'll put a knife or a spear under a, a paper bag and they'll get blindfolded. And they'll tell one person know where it is and he can feel where that person's tension is and he'll smack every single bag yes. except that one and David's done that too right I've seen him I like, mean everyone it's yeah, a very yeah. it's a famous <clears throat> trick but scary. we all it's scary I know a guy who went right through his no. hands and right on video one of my good friends in Israel what knife went right through and this is your livelihood we're talking about so there's real elements of danger but that so many people have done so if you either do danger or 
you do something that's endurance. Like what if I literally just, uh, you know, could walk up to every single person who walked up to me and, and uh, read their mind with something simple. Like if we played rock, paper, scissors, or yes. we flipped a coin and you do this with a thousand people in a row. And if I lose, I'm going to pay you a million dollars. Wow. So that That's... would be the next level where you don't introduce an element of danger, but you introduce oh an element of, wow, what if I could? So. That's the only way a real publicity stunt could work with mentalism unless you want – I don't personally like the danger because what do you want to happen? People actually want the bloodthirstiness where you actually want it. Otherwise, at the end, it's a bit of a letdown. You feel relieved they didn't get hurt, but part of you wants to see it. It's just natural. It's the gladiator. Crazy, It's man. Roman Coliseum. It's crazy. So I don't know if I want to kind of incentivize people to want to see me get hurt. No. Uh some people do. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Some people, when they hate me, like at the end of the show, they're like, yeah, I want to see this yeah, guy yeah, get yeah. stabbed. But uh, more of how many people's minds could I read at once because it gets exponentially more difficult. One-on-one, -on -one, the show is, is easier for what I do. But you suddenly incorporate 10 people, 15, 20. It's not 10 times as hard. It gets to be 1,000, 10,000. Right. So you have to watch everybody at once. And that's where it would be exciting for me and for everyone else. Well, didn't is that Lior? Didn't he do something like that on TV? You yes, said, where like everyone, a mass hypnosis. Everyone wrote effect. down a name and then they flipped it over. Uh, what was yeah, that? a drawing, a, drawing. It was a star, oh, a star. Yep. So that was very cool. So yeah, it's something he worked on for a while. A star is probably easier. A symbol is probably easier than a name. I of would think. Oh, hundred percent. So anyone can just you know, if you influence everyone's minds to go into a star, I'm assuming is what correct. You did, right. That's crazy, but still, in the whole audience. It was like everyone had drawn a star, and then one person in the corner had drawn a penis. It was a star. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you get 250 people on TV. Right. Someone's, someone's gonna drawing be like, ah, a dick. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, you know. Wow. PG-13. But wasn't he like, okay, don't make it like something like a tree or like this or like that. Like, of don't course. Saying, yes, illuminating yes, yes. things, right? Yep. I'm like, okay, what's the next thing? What's yeah, it's still, it's, that's, that's impressive. That's that, very that impressive. Power suggestion. Yep. Yeah, unbelievable, man. What's the thing that you've learned from the power of suggestion and, and human dynamics in terms of sales like sales and how you sell something if so if there's an entrepreneur listening or yeah. watching what could we take away that's more about persuasion or about uh, sales or about um, negotiation. negotiation oh yes. my goodness I mean what I do is so rooted in the skills of negotiation what's a few maybe one or two things Absolutely. that everyone should be doing in a negotiation so these aren't things that I've invented mind yes. you these are things that I use and that as a mentalist I'm uh, just a little more keenly aware of when people are going to react based on their body language but that expression of he or she who talks first loses in a negotiation is so true. People are scared to pause, to just let air settle. So for example, I almost never, when I used to do negotiations, would ever mention price. Just never talk about money. There was never, I would tell you everything about it and wait for you to ask about it. Mm -hmm. you, you know, everything about it until there, because otherwise you make that situation awkward. There's something to be said for, allowing people to simmer, to get excited about something, to build it up. And say how much. Exactly, before you go to how much. And then with the how much question, as soon as you list something, now this is obviously more rooted in a service versus if you're selling a product or a widget or mm -hmm. something else, then obviously negotiations don't really matter. But so many things are the art of the deal, right? Yes. I mean, if it's renting an apartment, if it's buying a car, if it's all these different things where there's different levels of power as to who wants something more than the other and finding that balance I mean, it's not going to be applicable to everyone's business, but once you're done speaking and you've laid something out, do not speak again. If you start backtracking, if you say, oh, it's, it's $2,000 and, and then they just let it hang and you let it go, yeah, well, what do you think? Or that's right there is the sign of weakness. Allow that other person to digest it. And honestly, I've let five, 10, 15 seconds go by and that's an eternity Forever. of somebody. And when then, you say the price or when you don't say the price? Well, I... It's, it's just changed now because I You're not have the agent. some exactly. Yeah, yeah. But when I was doing it, yes. and when I, is I, I would give a price and then I let that sit. I just, that's it. At that point, let them say what they want to say, mm. whether it works, whether it doesn't work, where they want to go with it, and then you move from there. Right. Uh, giving options is also a great thing. If you were to walk into a store and you don't really know what you're going to pay. There's a lot of things in this world that you don't know what you're going to pay. Until you get married, you probably don't know what a DJ or a wedding photographer or anything these things cost, right? So if you give out packages, like here's silver, here's gold, and here's platinum, people always don't want the cheapest option. They want to feel like they got a deal, but on something that's like yes. better, right? right There's right. always that feeling of you want to feel like you got a deal. So if you can build that into the cake, that's always great. Mm -hmm. That's always great. But if you negotiate on things, you're always going to negotiate. So there's mm -hmm. something risky to be said where if you're always negotiable, right. people will know that. And they'll always know that they can negotiate you down. So you need to decide where you want to be with that. Mm -hmm. um, What's the skill you've yet to master? 
that needs to take your game so to many. another level. So I think there's persuasion, human dynamics, there's I think suggestion, there's memory, there's all these different things you've mastered to a certain level, but what's, what's missing for you? Something I'm trying to always work on more and more is listening. When I tell you, uh, for example, uh, don't think of a pink elephant, mm -hmm. you immediately think about it. And all the viewers right now are thinking of a pink elephant. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. When you watch the number four, you can't think of three. You can't think of five. And I know it's like a po poker tale. When you look at it, I know what's a four. I know what's a three. I know what's a two. I know I, during the years, I- You've practiced it enough. Practice. It's, it's all about, it's like, it's like playing a piano. You know, everybody can learn to play a piano, but not everybody will be Mozart. So mm. I mastered the whole concept of understanding how people think. Now, if it's a, if it's a one through six, it'd be easier than one through a hundred. So is it same principle? Just, really? Same principle, just gonna be more sensitive. What? So, so if I was a one through a hundred dice. So for example, uh, for example, uh, in my show, I have an act where I have someone holds a coin in one of the hands, and I guess which hand is the coin every time, and it makes the audience laugh because I talk about body language. But somewhere inside their mind, they're saying, okay, it's a 50-50 chance, so, you know. And then I bring 30 people on stage. Mm. And now you have one to 60, and one of them is holding the, the coin. And now it's much more difficult, but I'm looking at them and I point to a person, and that person usually holds the coin. So it's a real, so it's the same concept you know, before, the, before we start shooting, we talked about uh, magician versus mm -hmm. mentalist. mentalist yeah. <clears throat> and I thought about what to tell you about that. When you watch a magician show, uh, you are amazed. You're blown away. Just like here. You were, oh my God, how did it happen? How did you know it? What's going on? But you know somewhere deep inside your mind that he didn't kill the girl, saw her in right, half, right. and then brought her back, right? And you know that when she levitated, you know it's not something from uh, quantum physics, uh, defying gravity thing. You know there's a trick, you don't know what is a trick, but there, you, know, you know it's not real. Right. You know it's an illusion. When you watch a mentalist show, there's another factor of belief because there is, you will ask yourself, is it really? Is it mm. true? Not true? Is it a is magnetic it dice? Magnetic is dice? Can you do it with my dice? Right, right. The answer is yes, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's lots of lots of more aspects than just wondering. So there's an element of belief. There's an element of of it's similar a little bit to same thing that happens in our brain when when we talk about religious when someone believes in God or not believe in God. There's you go out and you ask yourself, is it real or is it not real? It's not just a trick. So that's the main issue mm. between a mentalist and a magician. Wow. Mm -hmm. And there's not many mentalists. Talk there's not many. It. How many are there that are in world well, class in your mind? Not, not a lot. I'm, I mean, I think there's like less than 10 very good really? ones. Very good ones. Who's someone that you're inspired by? There's, uh, we talk about Darren. Darren is uh, amazing. amazing from England. I've got uh, another Israeli, Haim Goldenberg from Canada, who's a good friend of mine. Mm. Uh, there's two in Israel, which are very good. I mean, there's, there's, there's you know, Yuri Geller started the whole concept. You, you know the name? No. Yuri Geller in the 70s, Israeli, he took the concept, the first one, who took and took it to the stage. He used to bend spoons with the mind. Mm. So every time you think of spoon bend, you have something about, yes. that's him. He was wow. the one who did it. He became huge all over the world. He was a personal friend of Michael Jackson and John Lennon, and, wow. and uh, he was consulting them. He used to find oil. That's what, you know, according to what he says, of course, uh, to find oil with his mind, help companies, uh, advise companies. He was the first one who started the whole concept of taking the power of the mind, bringing to the stage and entertainment. Mm. And what I did with it, because I was always uh, very funny, you know, and you know, I always like to make fun and entertain people. I love the high energy of entertainment, and I love to be creative. So I took the concept and developed lots of creativity around it. And yeah. that's what you see in the live shows and the TV shows and all of that. Wow. So it's a lot of fun. What's something that um, someone's done that you think has blown you away, personally? Because I feel like so, you've seen it all, you, you know how a lot of people have learned their psychology and things like that, so I, you know. Well, if, to, if you think about it, uh, again, I go back to magic. Uh, a magician can do four things, any magician. He can make something appear from nowhere, or disappear, or transpose, you know, or levitate. Mm. That's it. 
that's like in like, lots of different ways. Exactly. Yeah. So like yeah. that's like four pillars. Now with what I do, same four pillars. I can read something, I can influence something, or guess something. You know, it's more like a reading. I can predict something, hmm. or I can uh, make things move, like the spoon bending or telekinesis stuff, brain power. On that, you build a story. Different, different story. Mm -hmm. It's like, like you, you know, you talk about motivational speaking, okay? Motiva thinking positive, it's, it's a fact. People need to think more positive. But every person takes it to how they see it and how they look at it. At the end, it's all about mindfulness and, and you know, getting yourself into the right position. But yeah. same thing here. There's four elements and I build the story, the crazy story around. And I give you, in the middle of the story, I give you traps and I give you ideas, and I give you, oh, I think I know how we did that, and then something came coming to the blog. So it's, it's a show, it's a live show, mm -hmm. it's, it's to entertain people. And when I see, and this is the truth, when I see people wondering, and here's an interesting thing that I don't think, I, I, nobody talked about it. What is a sense of wonder? What is it? What do you think is a wonder? What is when, wonder? When someone is wondering. They're curious. But if you wish, so you left, you went like, oh my God, oh my God. Some people will cry. Mm -hmm. Some people will go like this, and some people will just, hmm. And there's lot, I mean, it's we emotion, know. Yeah. Exactly. You know, laughter, you know, it's universal. This is laughter. Right. Sadness, you know, it's the opposite. Angry, you know, it's like this. Wonder, it's very individual. If you think of wonder, not everybody will go like this. Not everyone. Some people will go like this. Some people will be like shocked. Once I had a show and nobody clapped their hands at the end and I was felt sorry. I said, no, you understand. They were too shocked. Oh, wow. So I had to reprogram the show <laughs> to get uh, to, uh, to applause. Uh, applause. Yeah. So, so it's very interesting when you think about it. And when I see the audience wondering, becoming children again, that's amazing. Wow. And that's why I do what I do. Do you feel like you had a good childhood? Uh, define a good uh, childhood. Well, you say you want people to be like children again. That means I believe you know I have two children of my own, and you know the children. Did you see that there's a there's an, an amazing scene from the movie The Prestige? You see a magician. You're taking a little bird, and you go like this, and the bird disappears, and the audience goes, "Oh my God!" And the bird appears like in another place. <laughs> so everybody's like clapping their hand, and the little boy is asking, what happened to the first bird? Mm -hmm. And really, the magician had like a mechanic, something right, that he right. makes sure that he kills the first bird. Oh, no. Or something like that. Oh. But people, children has a, a sense of wonder. You know, they touch the iron because they're curious. And then they get uh, the burn. And they, uh, they uh, you know, I see my, my kid is doing something from, from Lego. And he's like, oh, look what I've done, look what I've done. Mm -hmm. It's they have this. When we grow up, we start to lose this. You go into the box. You know, you, you have your work and, you know, everything in the news and we start to lose this, this amazing feeling. Of so wonder. My, of wonder. And I'm here to get back. And you see, and you know, I don't want to name dropping, but you know some of the people that I perform Absolutely. for. Absolutely. Doesn't matter who you are. You can be known, I don't know, rich, poor, everybody's like leveled. And they have the sense of wonder, which is amazing. Wow. It's, a, it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. How old are your kids? Or? Uh, four and two. And do you perform mentalism on them? It's hard because mentalism is very, uh, uh, it's, sometimes it's not visual. It's not like magic <clears throat> visual. Sometimes right, it's very right. intellectual, you know. Something you, have you to, think about later. You think about, so it's hard to express it, but you know, working on that. You're working fun. out with them? A little bit. Because you're not like, voila, like there's, there's exactly, something in front of you. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's not an act. Exactly. That's why when I do a big show, <clears throat> Even if I, if I do a show for three thousand people, it the stage and the screens, it will, the production will be modest because it's not going to be explosions and stuff right, like smoke that. Smoke and everything, yeah. There's a little, of course lighting and we have screens and we have cameras because it's all about the interaction. But it's not going to be like, you know, fireworks and stuff like right. that because it's all about what's happening there. It's not about about. It's not about how big it is. It's about how, how emotional it is. How important is storytelling in mentalism? That's it's the, everything, huh? That's everything, that's everything. How did you learn how to tell better stories? I didn't, I didn't. You know, I just, uh, you know, it, it, I'll tell you a little story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was like 10 years ago, I did a show, and the guy came to me and told me, I have a show for a, 
a company uh, for a Swatch group in Switzerland, the Swatch brand. Mm -hmm. And I have all the retailers. Do you think it's, it's amazing? You think you can do something connected to the watch? And then I was like, hmm, it's like, ding, I have an idea. And then started infotainment. Infotainment, yeah. Infotainment, which is creating this stuff. I said, okay, so I know how to guess things for dice. What if it wasn't a dice? What if it was uh, different messages of a company? And you look at something and say, oh, you're looking at how important is the connection with the workers. And then I, would, I, I find myself uh, talking about the messages, conveying the messages, but in a way that people remembers it. Right. So for Swatch, I took 10 people on stage. I told them to, one of the acts, hold your hand above your watch, count to three, and I actually stopped all their watches. Stopped completely from they working. They all, you didn't touch the watches. I told them that I was <coughs> going like this to them, the watches stopped. But you didn't touch the watches. The audience goes wild, never touch the watch. The audience goes wild. <coughs> wow. One lady, from those 10 people said, my watch is still working. And I started to act like, no way, what's Nervous, going on, what's yeah. going on, what's going on? No, 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 it didn't stop. And I was, let me see, let me see. And I was going like, oh, you have this watch. And that was like a moment because, and then I said, what do you have, what do you have? And I talked about all the other brands wow. that I could stop, but I could not stop the watch. That's powerful. And the message was, <laughs> I can't do it. That's brilliant. And it was a metaphor. Of course, by the way, I could stop any of the watches. I just made it look like I, I, I acted as right, I right, did. Right. And I saw the owner of, uh, Mr. Hayek is the owner of, uh, he passed away, but uh, back then he was like, because you had 700 people who sell his watches, and now we wanted to say, <clears throat> how good That's, is the watch? Wow. So then, then I found That's myself brilliant. flying for a, Lots of uh, corporations, Fortune 500 companies, cybersecurity. Uh, for IBM, I did a competition. Who is smarter, me or Watson? Mm -hmm. You know, the in mm -hmm. artificial right. intelligence. Right. Uh, for Google, we did something. Uh, who is faster in searching, uh, the, me the master mentalist or Google? You know, so I create this. And I think this works on a principle that if I ask you, what were you wearing uh, three weeks ago on Monday, you know? Nobody, know. nobody knows. Know. But if I ask you, what did you do on the on the day of September 11 when the plane hit the twin? Mm. You remember exactly what you did. Yeah. Can you remember what I was doing? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was, <laughs> no, but I remember what I was doing. Yeah. And the thing, the, why do you remember it? Because it was an emotional impact. Yeah. Bad, negative one. You remember also the good things. Absolutely. So when I'm doing, when I'm standing in front of a company, and I create this sense of wonder, mind tricks, call it whatever you want, and people are like blown away, but this is connected to the messages of the new product. You're holding the new uh, cyber security product that mm -hmm. prevents hackers, and while you're holding it, I'm, I can't read your mind. Right. And people get the metaphor, yeah. and everybody remembers the messages, and it's better than any lecture, it's better than any PowerPoint show, mm -hmm. because people go home and say, oh, this guy was talking about a, the new uh, blah, blah, blah of uh, cybersecurity of the company. And when, when I hold this, he couldn't read my mind. And when I didn't hold it, he could read my mind. So it, it talks about right. this. What's the riskiest thing you've ever done that you actually, because usually you know like it's going to work, I'm assuming, I'm assuming. Like you know you've yeah. got to influence or They used, they used to have a time where I used to, one of the acts in the show, I used to have like a, like a Russian roulette. I used to have like, a, like a, a four knives. Uh, sorry, for oh, like right. bases and one knife, or something. something like that with the bags. That's scary. I used to play with uh, staple guns that, you know, one of them is loaded, all the rest is not loaded. You mix it up and I, then I, I find it and then I took it to the next step. I don't find it, you find it. So you take it and I take it and I go like this and I, oh and I click gosh. it. I did it in a television show in Israel, it was crazy. And then with time, I felt, I don't think it's for me. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. about the, if I'm right or wrong. If I'm wrong, it's very not for me, but, but because this is not, it's, um, it's very authentic, it's very, it, it might go wrong. And when I do a live show, and I just came back from Miami, I did a, it was a two hours live show, things got wrong. Really? But, yes, <clears> but <throat> the audience are not aware. Mm, it's part of the story. It's, it's like, part oh, of the okay, story. Let's, let's I'll, get, else. I'll get back to it later. There's, there was a guy who, in the middle of the show, he was a, like a heckler. He said, what's the name of my, my kindergarten teacher? Or what's the name of my friend? It happens. And I was like, I stopped the show and I was like, 
I, I started to tell jokes about him interrupting me. And I said, I'm sorry, the show is going to be extended. Then I went to him. But at the end of the show, at the end of the show, I wrote the name of his kindergarten teacher. Really? Mrs. Robinson, it was, remember? It was crazy, and everybody's like blown away because I have anchors. I know I'm first act, second act, third mm -hmm. act, but in between... Stuff can go... I go crazy. But people don't crazy. remember the failures necessarily because they're so, you always no. tie it around at the end. And by the way, this is, I mean, this is, this is, this is, it's like a philosophical psychology. Okay, let's say that you're holding, I'm just inventing something, you're holding a bill and you ask me to guess the serial number. Okay, and I go, okay, three, five, six, six nine, 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 whatever, and it's completely correct. Mm -hmm. And the audience applause. Let's say that I do it and I have a mistake in one digit. What's better? One digit out of the, of, out of the ten, uh, 10 or eight digits. I don't know. I'm pretty impressed if someone pulls it out and you get all the 10 digits. But in a show, I think that if I have a mistake... It tells like you're... It's, it's credible. I'm human. Uh, I'm like you guys. It's, you, you get... Got it. Uh, there's an act... You're not perfect. Exactly. Because then there's something has got to be off. Exactly. There's, there's some magic behind there. Exactly. I don't, believe, I don't believe you don't know this person. Exactly. Sometimes I get there's an act that I tell someone to draw something. We're standing back to back and we draw the exact same thing. And it's really spectacular, it's really cool. Sometimes I get the picture so good that I'm doing a little off on purpose. Really? Yeah, so he did the, a house and a tree and a sun. So I do a house and a tree, but I, I reverse it. I, I, I do... Oh, it's pretty close, yeah, yeah. Very, very close. And it's, it's I think it's wow. stronger. I think it's stronger. It's a little bit not a perfect match. Yes, I'm like a magician that you can't go a little bit. It has to be, be exactly. exactly, because if not, she's not levitating. If it's not, it's, it has to be. So on purpose, you'll mess it up. Yeah, I won't mess it up. I go close right. because I think it shows uh, credibility to the audience. But you really have the exact image in your mind. Sometimes, and sometimes, sometimes not, you know? Right. And sometimes I will not know it and I'll play on it in a different way and mm. I'll go from a different direction or. You'll come back to something else with them and tie it in somehow. Mm hmm Yeah, exactly. That's, that's part of the, the show. Why do you keep doing this? Um, I love the. I love how people react to it. I really, really. I love to perform. You know, I, I finish the show. I take a bow. I go out, and then I, sometimes there's like a encore or something like that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I go back and I just go down the stairs, and people coming to me, selfies and pictures. And there's like another 30 minutes of me taking pictures, signing, because I want to hear, and people come to me, oh my God, you inspire. This is not just, I don't think it's just entertainment. I think it's also inspiring. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit educational, because <clears throat> I don't, I, I, think, I think my next phase will be getting a little bit more educational, maybe l teaching something, maybe. Mm, really? Maybe, I don't know, maybe something that will help, not just for fun, something that will help you. Impact people beyond wonder exactly. and curiosity. So they'll go home and they will say, okay, I want to try to do something, uh, to be better or to, to do something. Um, I love the reactions of people, I love people, generally. What do you think uh, that will take for you to do in order to give people at the end of your performance, hour, two hours, whatever it may be, to be like, you know what, I'm going to change this part of my life. That's, to be better. That's the next step, I think. What is that, you think? I don't know yet. I, you know, I think when you see someone who's doing, you know, in the show, you saw the video with uh, Jerry, with the Rubik's Cube. Uh, yes. <coughs> Gerard Butler, yeah, yeah. So I gave him a Rubik's Cube. He mixed the cube. Yeah. He kept mixing it up behind his back. And then he showed that he solved it. And if people were like going crazy. It's crazy. So this is an act that I do in the show right now with two people. And this is an act that I call the act, uh, it's, it's an act about you're going, you're going to do the impossible now, not me. Right. Now, again, it's very philosophical because of course I'm doing it, I'm helping them, I'm controlling, I'm influencing, but I love to make it look like it's their moment right mm -hmm. now. So they go like this and like, they solved it. And it's really, really cool. So I think I'll add more aspects of that. The impossible is possible. Exactly. Mm. I, want, I want you to try to guess what he's thinking. Not just me. Not just the superstar on the stage. I want you to think of a number, and you to think of a number, and you guess the number, and I will show them how it's possible to do it. 
And I think this will inspire people mm. uh, to be more positive. Is this a skill that people can learn to get to a certain level beyond where they're at? Maybe they're not going to be able to get to your level, but how can we learn to be Definitely. more intuitive Definitely. in our own lives to be able to perceive people and influence people or persuade people, obviously in a positive way of integrity, but not mm -hmm. getting them to do something negative. But how can we tap into well, intuition more? I have to tell you something. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not religious. Uh, but every, I, I, I'm again, you know, we're in Los Angeles. Every every second, you have like the psychic uh, yeah, yeah. stores. I'm really against that. I'm against psychic. I'm against fortune tellers. Some of them using similar techniques like me. But if I look at you, I tell you to think of a name or something, and and I can guess it. I can guess it as a mentalist, as entertainment, or I can say I'm getting spirits, blah blah, yeah. and that's what they do. Yes. So they, so so they take advantage of people's. You know, they're in uh, beliefs, beliefs yeah. and they do it, so I hate that. But I really believe in karma, in psychological karma, not spiritual karma. I don't like the whole this kind of stuff, but psychological karma. So first of all, if you give to people, you get back, definitely. So I always try to, when there's a situation, I always say to people, well, okay, what can I do for you? What, what, how can I help you? If I can, I will help him. There's nothing uh, wrong with that, and I'm sure it will come back to me right. in another way. And it happens all the time. And, you know, there's some stuff that people can, you know, can learn. They can learn the basics of, uh, of uh, influencing, how to create a rapport, how the basic mm -hmm. of NLP a little bit, <clears throat> yeah. how, to, how to get more chances of the other person to say yes to you. Um, but it, it doesn't mean you're going to be on stage and guess right. things about people. Right. But, but how can we use this in our own lives to be better? Exactly. That, I think this is the next step for me. I wrote a book about this. Uh, it's called Mind Reader, Unlocking the Power of Your Mind to Get What You Want. So the whole book is filled with lots of mind tricks, mind questions. Uh, you're like you're running in a race, all right? You're running and you just passed uh, second place. Which place are you now? You just passed second you just, place. You just passed second place. So now you're, you're on right. second place. Exactly. But you thought about it. You yeah, wanted yeah. to say first. Yes. So yes. how the mind works. Oh, you interesting. See? It's interesting. Lots of fun stuff. You also fun. influence me by putting someone in first. And exactly, in. exactly. Yeah. So I teach about that. Lots of fun stories, mind tricks. Mm -hmm. And in between, there's a little bit of how to influence people, a little bit of um, how to be positive, you yeah. know, to give a compliment to people. Sure. For example. A compliment goes a long way. What? A compliment goes a long way. Exactly. exactly when you give exactly. a compliment, it's like you're already influencing someone to give you everything you want. In a sense, right? I agree. Is that I, why you hugged me twice? I'm just kidding. Yes, and I hugged you also. <laughs> exactly. No, it's funny because I always lead with a big hug when I meet someone. It's it's wonderful. And I I usually hug like a second longer than you're supposed to, but so also make you. it playful. And you're like talking fun. with an Israeli Jewish, okay? Uh -huh. You know what's chutzpah? You know what's chutzpah? Chutzpah is a chutzpah. You could Google it. I've heard of it, but tell is me. a word. It's like positive rudeness. It's uh -huh. this. It's this. Hey, how are you? <laughs> and sometimes Americans like. Yeah. Germophobic. Give me you know? space. Give me yeah, space. Yeah. Give me space. <laughs> uh, Japanese, you know, like very. Uh -huh. But sometimes, uh, sometimes it's there's a funny about uh, Israeli. You say never interrupt an Israeli while he's interrupting somebody else. <laughs> I'm sure. So, so I have this uh, thing of chutzpah, and it works. I think. I think uh, the hugs. Mm -hmm. You know that the embracing, yeah, embracing the it, it creates a con immediate connection. Yeah. A hug is a universal way to say, "Hey, great to meet you," or something like that. Um, for Americans, sometimes it can be embarrassing a little yeah. bit, a little bit, yeah. but they say that you're positive, so it's all good. What do you say are like three, four, or five things? Your top thing is that if people did more of they would automatically just be more influential. People would want to be around them more, people would say yes more, or give them more information, or want to work with them more, whether it be business, intimate relationships. A there, few things that just like... I'll tell you something, I'll tell you something. Yeah. There's, there's an amazing uh, book called Influ Influence. Yeah, Influence uh, by Robert Cialdini. Cialdini. Yeah. Seven, seven things, yeah. Exactly. It's crazy. So one of the things he talks about, and it's, it's really interesting, he talks about um, when you give, when you give, and it sounds bad, but it's not bad. Reciprocity, you, or yeah, no, 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 yeah. So when you give, no, no, when you give someone something, he he will want to give you back. Reciprocity, yeah. Exactly. Law of reciprocity, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and you can see it in in you know in in from individual to countries. Mm. 
So for example, you know, we have the Israeli uh, government and Turkish government, for example, they're, they're sometimes they're like friends, not like on and off, connected to the situation, Turkey and uh, Israel. And sometimes it's a bad relationship, sometimes it's a good relationship. But there used to we have, a, I think there was a few years ago, there was a big earthquake in Turkey and we sent the first uh, special units to help and save them, mm -hmm. no matter what, what's the relationship between the politics. Right. Save it. Save people, yeah. Israel is always, by the way, in Thailand, when they had With the kids, the Israel sends people to wow. help. Always, 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 always. And you put politics aside. Then we had, a few years ago, we had a big fire in Haifa in Israel. Big, huge fire. And the Turks sent the super tankers to help us back. And it's kind of like, and it shows, and, and the next day, you know, the prime ministers can Arguing, say, yeah, we yeah. hate you. <laughs> and, and and it shows something interesting. So the first thing I think when you're in a group of people, always be the first one to say, uh, "How can I? Let me let me help. How let can me, I support how you? How can I support help. you?" Uh -huh. And I'm not talking about uh, giving money to people. I'm not. It's just help in a in a way. In a way. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. So how do you deal in a negotiation with the kind of person who has to win, who has to get everything they want, they're very controlling, alpha, right? and it's their way or no way? Well, getting everything they want is actually third on their list. First of all, being in control is number one on their list, and that's emotionally satisfying. Mm. The second thing is the alpha type, which is, uh, we refer to that as the, the assertive. The one thing that's more important to them than actually getting what they want is being respected and making sure that you know everything about what they're coming from. So, and it's a classic guy who's working for his boss and said, you know what, my boss didn't do what I wanted him to do, but he heard me out, or she heard me out. Mm. I can live with the direction that we're going as long as I know that my boss knows my opinion. And so that the assertive type of negotiator, it's really more important to them that they felt felt that they uh, conducted themselves respected, respectably, that you respected them, and that you knew what they were coming from. Mm. And once they know those things, they'll actually soften up on what they want. If they feel disrespected, they'll probably be more frustrated and angry and right. demanding. Right, 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 right. So you have because to Because when they're very demanding... What they're really saying to you sub subtly is, I want you to know how important this is to me. Right. I want you to know how important I am. So, so how do you meet that person? Just come to them with respect or with yeah, calm? Was, or you know, you could say, look, you're, you're, you're impressive. You're phenomenal. You've thought it's all out. This is very... Yeah, I mean, clearly you know where you're coming from. You know what you want. Um, I'm lucky to be talking to you at all. <laughs> right. I mean, if were I to sit down with, with Donald Trump, I would, in fact, be lucky to be in the same room with him. That'd be the first thing I'd say to him. I'd say, you're, Stroke his ego. you're an American icon. Right. You know, you, you're the symbol of American business, certainly in New York City. Yeah, you know, stro stroking her ego is not a bad thing. One of the, one, and, it, you know, it's a version of empathy because that, that's how they see themselves. Mm. And, you know, the, 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 the emotional recognition, like emotional currency is not going to solve every deal. I just don't want to try to solve any deal with money when I could have solved it with emotional currency. I'm mm. saving my money. With emotional yeah. empathy, currency, intelligence. Right, yeah. right. My money's too important to me to waste it when I could buy something with satisfaction. Mm. So, yeah, like I mean, that. I'm, an, I'm, I'm enormously tight with my dollars. And so many people, well, they're, especially men in business deals, I feel like there's a lot of alpha men who are trying to get what they want. And so somehow they'll, they'll lose money because they're not able to have empathy or they're not able to whatever. They're yeah. not able to drop their ego. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of money's left on the, pay, on, the, on the table over stuff like that mm. or what they value themselves out. Like price is the most important. Price is the most emotional term in a negotiation because you value yourself based on price. But if I can get you to value yourself in another way, it puts you on a magazine cover. Mm. I mean, it, Stroke it, the ego in some other way. It used to be you get Donald Trump in any magazine you wanted to if you put him on a cover. 
You know, imagine the amount right. of time, and that used to be his deal. If you want to do an article on Donald Trump, the deal was he made the cover. And and then he would knock himself out for the people doing the articles. Oh, yeah. On access. Anything. Answering questions. Yeah. Imagine how valuable his time was. They got a cover to the magazine anyway. They got to put somebody on it. Right. You know, now they're trading something that costs them nothing. Right. And he's giving them stuff dynamic interviews and he's promoting them hard and he's sharing them with everyone yeah, he's exactly framing right. it everywhere and yeah interesting yeah so you you know you're buying donald trump with emotional recognition uh so what are the characteristics that make a great negotiator in your field and also how do those translate into the business and relationship world just in general outside of well let the other side go first um you know most people have are so so they're, they're burning with their argument. Here's why you should make this deal. And they've got that memorized. And, and they're not going to listen to a word you say till they get it out. So trying to talk to them is really like trying to talk to a paranoid schizophrenic. Because right. they're rehearsing their speech in their head and their logic. And so they, they just you just can't get through to them. Mm. So you let them go, you let them go first. And um, uh, another guy, Ned Coletti, uh, former GM of the Dodgers friend of mine here in town phenomenal negotiator mm -hmm. he's net lectured at uh in my class at usc also you know and ned always likes to let the other side go first you know he, he did the barry bonds deal he's done a ton of deals across the board and ned says well you know in a two-hour phone call there's going to be 90 seconds of solid gold where my the person i'm talking to based on changes that they made in their tone of voice and the adjectives that they used. I mean, he's got an instinct for it. He couldn't, he couldn't identify. He just always said, there's 90 seconds of solid gold. And I'd say, what is that? <laughs> right. And we, we talk it through. And he says, well, yeah, it's going to be a change in the tone of voice. It's going to be a different kind of adjective. So Ned wants you to go first because he wants to know what's going to take to make the deal. What they want. Right. Yeah, what, what, they, what they're burning them. for or how they characterize what they have. Mm, or what they're not saying, too, maybe. Exactly right. What someone has failed to say is often a lot more important than what they have said, which is why I give it a little if, if thought in advance. All right, what, they're gonna, what are they going to say if, they, if they've got this? So I, I actually like to look for more of what they haven't said, what's glaringly missing. And that's going to take – I'm going to need you to walk through it a couple of times before that jumps out of me. Mm, okay, okay. Um who are the most difficult people to work with then? Would you say it's the alpha people or would you say it's the uncertain people or what type of people are hard to work in negotiation with? You know, you're talking about a little bit of a tight match and that, that has, a, has a tendency, it's a little bit based on how bad I want to make the deal. Like, I don't like liars. Hmm. Or I don't like, the most difficult people to work with in the long run are people who haven't thought anything through which is as bad as a liar, only their heart's not in the wrong place. They don't know what they want right. specifically. Or they don't know how, how they're going to, they don't know how they're going to get this done, which is, again, we go over and over again. I go over and over again. Yes is nothing without how. Like, and the person who thinks like, yes is going to make a deal. Well, yes is not going to make a deal because you got to have how. Mm. How are we going to put this together? And someone that doesn't think things through a lot of times, they're actually kind of dysfunctional on their own side. So they'll make promises they can't keep, and they have no idea they can't keep those promises. Right. And so when they take your deal, you think you've done a deal with them, they take it back to their company, and their company goes like, no, we're not doing this. It's a stupid idea. We can't do this. Sure. And that happens a lot. I think in, in a private sector, I've heard from a number of companies that fully 50% of the deals that they make that don't go through get killed internally. Because somebody cut a deal for them and they took it back to the company. And the company mm. says, no, that, that violates our terms and conditions. Right. We can't deliver on that basis. So you're dealing with someone who just has no, uh, doesn't have a clue as to what's going on on their side. Sure. A lot of people like that. When you're making a business deal, what do you recommend as the amount of time to consider the deal before saying, yes, let's do it? Like, um, here's the deal points. Here's what you want. Here's what I want. Okay, should we sign it right away? Should we give it 24 hours? Should we take it to our team? Should it be a week? You know, what's like kind of a standard, you think? Um, and, unless you've got something in line a, a ahead of time. Um, the, the company name is the Black Swan Group because we believe there's black swans in every negotiation, which is something you didn't know that as soon as you found out, it's going to change all the parameters. The deal. Gotcha. So you sit at, down at the table to find out the unknowns. 
Huh. And you, it's impossible to research all the unknowns. Plus, a lot of the unknowns, I'll find them a lot faster if I just ask you. Right. And I could research for two weeks something that I may be able to get you to tell me about in 10 minutes. For example, what do you mean something you'd want to ask? Um, I'm, do, I'm uh, speaking to a long, for a long-time client, and they have another co- firm that I've been affiliated with coming doing a different block. When I found out they were doing that block, I could subtly reach back through my network to find out what the, the competing slash partnership firm of mine is, mm. what they're charging, or I could just flat out ask them. Well, I need to get the information. A lot of information you got to get by not asking. You got to trigger it. The, you know, the, the phrase, ask good questions, it's really get good information. And a lot of times you won't tell me stuff if I ask. But if I act like I already know, or if I, there are other ways, hostage negotiators trigger information without asking questions. And hostage negotiators get that information and make you feel good about giving it at the same time. Mm. So give me an example, either in a hostage or a business deal, what that kind of trigger could be. Well, it's going to be it's going to be some sort of a statement. I might say, look, I'm I'm sure my my competing company's charging twice as much as I am. Oh, and then they'll tell you the answer. They want to correct me. Oh, actually, no, it's the right. same, or actually, you're getting a better deal. Never underestimate the huh. other side's desire to correct you. Wow. Because it makes people feel powerful and smart. You know, you're going to want to feel smarter than me. One of, one of my clients is negotiating a deal for a commercial office building in South Carolina, and it's uh, it's almost 100% occupancy. It's in a mixed-use uh, historic area, so it means the the building can't be knocked down, and nobody can build in it because it's an historic area. Mm-hmm. And so the building is basically impossible to replace, and it's 100% occupancy. It makes no sense to sell the building. So they're genuinely thinking, why is the seller selling? First of all, you can't ask why, because why makes people defensive. If I look at you and I say, why did you wear a black shirt? Your instant thought is going to be like, do I got to defend the black shirt? Why I'm doing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you need to find out why, but you can't ask why because it makes people defensive. Huh, so what would you ask there? Well, then again, you don't want to ask at all because if you're smarter, you change your why, why's to what's. And it's more likely they'll respond if you say, you know, what's making the seller want to sell? So, you know, what is causing them to do that? Mm-hmm. Not why are they selling? But instead, what my student did was he said, well, Seems to me the seller's selling a cash cow because of a disbelief in the market fundamentals and the future of the, of the building. Now, let me correct you. This is why I'm doing it. Exactly. Huh. And the other side went like, no, 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 they, they, got, they got a couple of buildings that are underwater. Now, I, don't, I can't imagine a real estate agent answering that question ever. I mean, this is, this is highly confidential. All right. Proprietary info. You know, my seller is desperate for money is, is what, the, what the answer was. But because it was a correction and people love to correct, they'll correct you without thinking it through. It's an involuntary response, a desire to sound smarter to right. than you yeah. and to be right and yeah. correct you, which is a burning desire in most people because it makes me feel smart and more powerful. Mm. And I'll seize every opportunity to feel smarter and more powerful you at the table. Gosh, it's like chess. Uh, It's emotional chess. (laughs) Emotional chess. I love this. It's emotional chess. And how do women and men compare as negotiators, as as counterparts either against each other or woman-man, woman-woman, man-man? Is there a difference? See, I think a powerful woman negotiator, a woman who's really good at negotiation, is almost unstoppable. Wow. Um, and I think that the reinforcement, the societal reinforcement is constantly trying to pound men into being better negotiators and constantly trying to pound women away from it. And I think that I think the, um, the step from sympathy to empathy is a shorter step. And women are socialized to be sympathetic. And I don't think they're, uh, you know, whether or not it's nature or nurture, I know there's a lot more pressure societally and culturally, culturally for women to be like that. And I, in my class, women pick my style of negotiation up faster than the men do. And the women that go to my class start cutting bigger and better deals faster than the men do. In business or in life or in just... In both. Gotcha. Wow. So in, in, in my view, 
I like, think that like after they graduate, they go on to do well in the class. Okay, you got you got to negotiate with skin in the game in my class, and really? almost all of my students are rising star business executives. So um, mock negotiations, they're making more is what you're saying. No, in real life, man. Real life, you got to take, take it out my stuff world. and put it in real life. Why you're in my class, and you got to write about it. Wow. And uh, one, you know, I've got everything from a billion dollar Wall Street transaction. People in my class use the tools for. I get a, a USC get a lot of commercial real estate state transactions. Wow. A lot of people buying commercial real estate that are that are working on MBAs. I've gotten a lot of those transactions. Got uh, you know my favorite my favorite way to say no, which I got you know the how question before. Uh huh. The favorite way to say no is how am I supposed to do that? Just real calm deference. There's great power in deference. You know, that's and that's what I did. And kidnappings, bank robberies, everything. How, how am I supposed to do that? And what if they say, I don't care, figure it out, or she's dead? Well, then you know that you've pushed them as far as you can, and that means you've got to pivot to something else. Now, the, and, and that's actually where you want to get to because mm-hmm. the strategy of negotiation is to find out you want to max every term if you can. And the only way to max that is to find out that I've hit you to the full limit without making you angry enough that you slam your hands down and walk away. Because mm-hmm. even your reaction or just you now. Or you shoot someone. Or you shoot someone. Your reaction just now is like, look, you got to do it or things are going to go bad. Yeah. And it was uh, one of my one of my uh, students here in town is negotiating for, uh, uh, for a luxury client for, to rent a house in Hollywood Hills. And, you know, 20 grand a month was a rental. Mm. And... They were uh, trying to get the rental, or they were trying to lease. It? Trying to get it. Gotcha. And so the uh, person said it's twenty grand a month. Right. Yeah. And 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 it's from a very well. His client's extremely wealthy. So they, you know, and you're negotiating a wealthy market. The other side always thinks you got all the money in the world. Mm-hmm. And so the, uh, he just said, how, "How am I supposed to do that?" And they said, "Okay, well." And they shifted the terms, and he cut the price, and he moved a bunch of other terms around. Then they negotiated for a while longer, and then he said, again, on the price, he says, How my client, how's my client supposed to pay that? And the realtor says, if your client wants a house, he's got to pay it. Bang, you got a deal. When the other side says, if you want it, you have to do it, mm-hmm. which will come af- usually after the second, third time that you said, how am I supposed to do that? So you knock it down a little more on a car, a real estate deal, whatever it is. Now, now you've maxed that term. Now you move on to something else, so you make the deal. But you needed to know that you pushed them as far as you could have mm-hmm. without them storming out, or without them saying, Chris Voss is not any fun to deal with. I would never do business with him again. They, how am I supposed to do that in a deferential way? Right. They still feel in control. They're not, you're not saying, screw you, that's too much. Like, what are you out of your mind? You know? Right. And if you don't make the deal at that point, then what they say after the fact, they say, you know, uh, I didn't make a deal, but i deal with them again. Mm-hmm. You know they're 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 all right they're all right to uh, to deal with. Did they get the lease? Did how much did they get? Yeah, they got it. How much? You know, uh, they they knocked it down to less than twenty, and then they got some softness on some other terms. Gotcha. And, and then they then they cut the deal for the house. There you go. And I wish I was paying twenty grand a month for a house. <laughs> That's a lot of money for a house. <laughs> twenty grand a month. Wow. That's a rich rich student. Yeah. Well, <laughs> USC they get you know oh, people true. that are involved in a lot of lucrative deals. Yeah, yeah. So. You're saying, what is the importance of empathy in a negotiation? What I'm hearing you say is it's extremely important. And that's why you feel like a woman would be a better negotiator in general, because they have more empathy in general? Or Well, it's the shortest. Most people have confused sympathy with empathy. Okay, what's the difference? Um, empathy is, I can see you're upset. It's just identifying how you feel. Uh, sympathy is like, wow, I feel bad for you. Uh. So uh, feeling sorry or bad for someone is sympathy. Sympathy. It's it's it is in fact in view. It doesn't help anybody. Like I don't care if you feel bad for me. Right. <laughs> I could care less. So sympathy is not a good thing. Sympathy is a weakness. As a negotiator. As in a negotiation. Empathy is a good thing. Empathy uh, and tactical empathy because okay. we've really taken a past just empathy in general. Mm-hmm. Like we've been doing this long enough that I know what I'm looking for before we sit down. I know that. I need to find out the stuff that are negative emotions for you because I need to get them out of the way of the deal. And I need to find out the stuff that are positive emotions for you because I want to reinforce that to make the deal. And I know that the negatives are going to have be a bigger deal to you than the positives are. So can you give me an example of this in a business deal? What that would 
Well, if I don't, if I don't, if I don't like doing business with Donald Trump at all, then if he get if he's annoying me to the point where I get enough satisfaction keeping money out of his hands, I won't make that deal. Mm. Or if I'm in a business deal where, where the other side, and, and I've thought about this, like you annoy me so much <laughs> that I don't want you to get anything. That I'll take less money to keep you out. Right. So and, how would you eliminate something like that, that negative in the deal, so that you could? Well, then, then say like, I, I, if I think that you're negative towards me, I'm going to say, look, I'm, I'm sure it seems like I'm greedy here. If I say to you like, I'm sure I'm going to seem very greedy here. That sets me up to ask for a lot of money hmm. because there's actually um, science that backs this up now. Identifying a negative diminishes it every time. So if I'm going to make a big grab for the money, you're going to think I'm greedy. And I need to get that out of the way because if I'm too greedy, hmm. you're going you're gonna to get some satisfaction by keeping me from the money, even if you don't get any. Right. And so I'm going to say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seem real greedy here. I'm going to seem like I'm very self-centered and that I'm greedy and that I'm not looking out for you at all. And then I'll just let it sit. And you'll take a lot more from me, a lot, a lot. You'll, you'll allow me to take more if I've said that in advance. Up front, really? Yeah. Because I've, I've diminished that. Your, your thought is like, I mean, how, I, I can never seem too greedy then. When I make that grab, you're right. going to say, well, he was honest with me. He told me he wanted a lot of money. He didn't try to say, hey, look, let's do a win-win deal. Now, give me all the money. Right. Because if I say I want to do a win-win deal with you, I'm like, hey, I'll be nice to you. I'll look out for you. And then when you try to take 90 grab, and give me 10. It's like, right. oh, it's not a good deal. Yeah. But when you say it up front, then you're more likely to get the deal. Yeah. And get more of whatever you want. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seem very honest to you. I'm gonna, you're, you're, you're gonna like that I was honest with you, <laughs> and you're gonna say after the fact, like, "Look, he was honest. I always knew where he was coming from. I didn't like the deal, but I did it anyways, or whatever." Yeah. Huh. Okay. It's yeah. It's crazy. It's that's this the stuff that we found out that works regularly. We had uh, talk about another one we talk about in the book. Uh, there was a multi-million dollar deal going down in Washington D.C. The subcontractor was very unhappy with the general contractor, and a female negotiator. And they were getting ready to lose everything. And they sat down and they said, you know, I'm sure we seem like the big guy that doesn't care about you. I'm sure we seem like the big general contractor that's trying to take complete advantage of the sub and not appreciate how hard you're working for this and not care about your future at all. And she turned that deal around and when she was done, she took an additional million in profit for herself <laughs> and her company and the other side liked them more. So not only did they increase the profit, but they had a better relationship. This is why being honest up front or empathetic or I can see how you might feel that we're going to do this. It's a tactical approach. Wow. There are negatives here. We're going to address the negatives. Up front. And we're going to make them go away. Yeah, wow. address them up front. Most people don't want to do that. I already did that. Do you know when I did that to you? When? I've already done it. Remember when we talked about doing the one-on-one -on -one role play? Yeah. I said it was going to be horrible. Oh, that's true. You said it up front, yeah. And I always, I always do that every single time the same way because if you do the role play with me, no matter how it goes, I, you know, you're going to feel like you were beaten, beaten up. Right, but at least you told me I was going to be. Right, and you can't come out. That's if I say it's going to be horrible, you know, you can't ever say, well, he sandbagged me. You know, he caught me off guard. Right. And then, then what I always do, then I, I diffuse the negative and then I pitch the positive. And most people pitch the positive and hope the negative will go away. They sandwich the negative. Positive, yeah, this, negative, positive. The same, I don't like sandwich at all. Start with the negative. Start with the negative. And I said, and you will learn more than anyone else. And the way we do it um, in the in Spec Ops is we, we control what we can control. So some, some people have referred to it kind of control your three foot world, right? But it doesn't have to extend. It's not a. It's not a three foot thing. It's it's what in this moment can I control? And then take control of that, mm. right? Because then you are grabbing onto certainty.